Hey guys, what's up? It is week 258, and uh, this is going to have my Cinema Wasteland update in it. Although I went to Cinema Wasteland like a week, I don't know, it's been like two weeks after it came out. So yeah, it's a, it's a fairly decent size update. Besides Cinema Wasteland, I haven't been buying too much. I had to save up, and it's like hitting that point now where it's like kind of like spending a lot of money on sales and stuff. It's like, you're a little broke in April for some reason. It always tends to happen after Wasteland. But uh, yeah, anyways, Cinema Wasteland was a blast. I, I stopped doing footage because like... It almost becomes like, uh, I feel like so rude just putting the camera in people's face. I know people do enjoy watching the footage and like a lot of that old footage, I look, I, if I ever look back on, I'm always like, oh wow, there's so-and-so back there. So it's, so it's really cool. But uh, yeah, maybe next time I'll film in October. I definitely will. Um, I, I guess a bunch of people are supposed to go for the 22 Shots of Moods and Podcast. That will be really fun to meet up and hang out. Now I know that I did, uh, they mentioned that I probably wouldn't be on as many 22 Shots episodes and, and I, I probably wouldn't, I won't be, but after the summer break, I'm going to try to do more episodes i'll definitely be there for the retro years if anybody's wondering um yeah so uh cinema wasteland we, we i got there and we hu i hung out with mostly cage and stuff but i did uh get to hang out with some other people that i'll be talking about a little bit more when i discuss their movies it was, it was very cool to do that and had a good time and everything like that um, as far as the new podcast feed, I, I believe there might be an off chance you have to resub because I switched from Podbean to Anchor. Um, I changed my uh, still too. If you notice, uh, I had Dustin Mills draw up a kind of a new kind of like logo, not logo, but kind of picture for the podcast. I think it's really cool. If anybody's ever seen the Anthropophagus, I love that. I love that poster. I like the movie. I love George Eastman. There's always the old cool old school joke when I was looked a little bit younger, a little bit healthier. I look like George Eastman from uh, you know from others stuff so uh basically it's me eating my guts but instead of guts it's film uh yeah check it out um and and please sub if you are sub to the uh podcast it would be greatly appreciated if you left a review i don't have many ratings or reviews on itunes or apple podcast uh, or whatever you say it but the podcast version the audio version of this show if you don't want to watch a, a hour and a half a two-hour video of uh, youtube video which i completely understand there's an audio version of it it hosts uh, all the weekly episodes and also the secret top 10 uh, so basically all you do is sub on there. It's on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, um, some other places, Anchor. So all those places, you should be able to find it if you search it. Uh, Mr. Parka's weekly uh, update and review or the secret top 10 Mr. Parka should pop up. And, and also let me know how uh, you're giving me feed. I need like feedback on the secret top 10. Any people you'd like to see on there. Anyways, I'd really appreciate it if you guys would uh, write me a review on iTunes. I don't expect it or any, any place you listen to because uh, it would help out quite a bit. I know like a lot of people say that like I don't like to ask people for much on this like and whatnot but it does help and literally I have one review on iTunes I mostly I feel like most people do watch on YouTube so that I can understand that but if you listen to on the podcast feed leave me a review uh, that would be greatly appreciated we're, we're approaching the five year mark now and I've not missed one show uh, so I'm pretty sure on uh, week 260 um, that's 52 weeks you know times five is 260 I will uh, have a um, kind of a contest i don't really know what to give you guys or anything like that but uh yeah anyways i had a blast at wasteland i'll show you everything i picked up uh your money doesn't go as far nowadays i have to say a lot of the deluxe editions and all that stuff it doesn't really go as far as it used to i also switched angles i switched the camera over here this time and i'm gonna look this way you see that a little bit different i feel like now you get a view of different movies instead of seeing the same movies on this side now you can see other things in the background maybe i'll even turn the camera around once that would be really wild anyways let's hop into the reviews some of the ones are going to be ones i picked up at wasteland because i jumped in there i'll mention it and then i might not show them in the um i might not show the movies when it comes to um you know uh, in the update because if i if i review them and show everything there's no real point so let's hop into the first one this is from edge uh, red central pictures or epic and this is uh midnight um, this is a South Korean kind of thriller serial killer film. And uh, yeah, anyway, South Korea really doesn't uh, do that much wrong when it comes to their movies that make it to America. And I would say that Midnight, uh, it, it's pretty enjoyable. I liked it quite a bit. It's more it hits the suspense thriller kind of uh, deal because like, although there is like stalking and some serial killings in the beginning, it, it, it's more of like the suspense edge your sheet, edge your seat kind of thing here. So anyways, what we have here is we kind of follow a couple main characters. We have a police officer who uh, basically has a, a younger sister. She's probably like early 20s. She goes out and stuff. 
stuff like that. And he's always kind of like really apprehensive about it because being a cop and everything's overprotective, their parents are not in the picture. And then we also follow um, a deaf girl and her mother who's also deaf. They both suffer from it. Um, deaf and um, they're mute. Um, so so they're, they both suffer from that. And, and that is like kind of a, a thing that in a lot of horror movies used to do. Or, or there's been a what, hush that had that. It's always like, well, they always have a character in the movie like, well, they're deaf or they, 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 um, they're blind and then it just adds this weird extra element to the stalking or their fear stuff and, and they can kind of play around with some things and get some advantages for the characters and some disadvantages so essentially what happens here is there's this very handsome serial killer in the very beginning you kind of see how his handsomeness and his you know the way he dresses and presents himself kind of gets him out of situations so he commits these uh, these murders in, in like kind of a really kind of like seedy looking they make this area look seedy and, and desolate at times and just creepy uh, the places that the murders take place um, late at night, those kind of things. So this this woman is killed and taken advantage of. And like he has the Bundy approach where he kind of talks to her and, and kind of gets her guard down, although she's protective. But, you know, eventually she's going to fall to him. And there's there's a point in here where the character is almost caught, like a lot of serial killers, but they charm their way out of it, which adds this layer of, you know, um, kind of what they would think later that they're meant, they're destined to do it or they're, they're, they're kind of, you know, um, confidence goes up. And, and that's kind of where we leave this serial killer at here so as the movie progresses we kind of cut to the other characters and of course they're all gonna come across this serial killer and a big chunk of the movie is kind of deceitfulness from the killer and people not understanding who is who and not putting the pieces together until it's too late and there's a lot of these reveals and situations like that where the killer's just slipping through like this system and everything it, it's a uh, it's really like i said suspenseful it's well shot there's these great chase scenes through the streets where characters chasing another character another character and uh they definitely play with with the the kind of deaf thing uh, of course and, and like you'd always get the stuff where the the you know the victim the possible victim cannot hear the killer and that's suspenseful but they also play into the fact that it has her mother involved which they're both deaf so they can communicate behind the killer and, and kind of sign language and the killer starting to catch on that they might be saying some things that he doesn't want before they kind of reveal everything that's going on but uh yeah it's it, the movie is not like have an extreme kill count or anything like that but it does kind of bring up some uh some interesting points about serial killers and about you know how people look in society and you know what what they actually are because sometimes somebody that can change their appearance or look wholesome or, or handsome can get away with murder literally um, while someone who has trouble communicating or maybe has some sort of um, you know thing that they have against them in, in terms of you know like a um, what's the word a disability they can be looked at as something more of a threat, even though that's not what's going on. Anyways, uh, Midnight is a really well shot, well acted movie. I would recommend checking it out. Um, yeah, I enjoyed this one quite a bit. Um, South Korea doesn't really do too many bad thrillers, horror films, or revenge films that I've seen. I'm sure they have them. <laughs> I'm sure they don't typically make it to America very often. But uh, yeah, this one I would recommend checking out. And this is the 40th. I don't know if anybody keeps track of the, the numbers on the side of these Dread Central Presents. There's been 40 releases so far, and I think I've covered a good chunk, at least half of them and I will probably continue to do that because a lot of them are new films and they do interest me quite a bit for the most part they're usually I, I don't want to say hit and miss I've never seen anyone that was complete horrible but I've seen some real gems in there I loved um um, Uncle Peckerhead and Harpoon were both really good and stuff like that. So this is Midnight. Check it out. I would recommend it. Uh, good stuff. Okay, guys. Now you're going to have to pull out your pervert card. And this is going to be more of a pervert block of about five movies consecutively. And um, all five of them are Japanese films. Uh, most of them made in Japan. Uh, although one is kind of American or German co-production with Japan. Not necessarily sure. But this first one here is from the Vikatsu Erotic films collection and it's from impulse pictures uh you guys know the the kind of sub label under synapse and they've been releasing a lot of these nikatsu erotic films i've been covering them as they come out I, I haven't got a lot of the early ones but i've been covering a slew of them and this one is assault the 13th hour and everybody would know that this is aka rape the 13th hour and obviously they changed the title because rape in the title is not something that's probably gonna be able to put on amazon or anything like that or whatever regardless you can kind of understand the name change here but uh yeah this one was was made in 1977 and uh yeah i was kind of uh taken back about the the, the nihilism in this movie and, and how kind of depraved it was and how downbeat and 
totally weird it was, but at the same time, it had, like, of course, an artistic flair, which a lot of these Nakatsu movies have. Now, what I'll say about the Nakatsu Erotic Films collection is there's a, there's definitely a mixture among them. Sometimes you'll get some lighthearted, although fetish-style kind of sex comedies that are always inappropriate. I mean, the Nakatsu movies are always not going to be for everybody, right? And then you'll see something that's really kind of dark and nasty and gritty, like... Um, Star of David, which was just like one of the kind of like extreme movies of its time, to be honest, or um, White Rose Campus, which is just an all out sleaze rape fest. And I would put that assault of uh, the 13th hour is more in line with something like that, although it definitely had a couple spins and artistic flares about it. So it, it kind of is a, the storyline where, you know, you have like those kind of uh, serial killers or, or criminal kind of duo where we have the older guy who's kind of taking the younger guy under his wing. The younger guy obviously looks like they both obviously suffer from some mental problems that are doing this. Um, but the younger guy definitely seems like he has kind of like a he he um definitely uh, admires the older guy kind of in a simple similar situation like house on the edge of the park where we have alex and ricky david has character uh giovanni redici uh giovanni lamberto redici kind of looks up to him there's a lot of that kind of thing going on in these movies and, and i feel like in real life where you have the partner criminal like duos where one is definitely in charge so we have this older guy who, who's kind of like he almost has like this really kind of i don't even want to say this like suave uh, thing about him like he's definitely an egotistical crazy person but uh, you get the idea that he doesn't like commit these robberies and these rapes because he he has to like for sexual purposes I, I mean they are sexual purposes but he doesn't he could easily have sex with many people and he seems to be kind of known among a lot of the other criminal elements but um he, he definitely uh is just a deviant like in a lot of ways degenerate and like in, enjoys exploiting these people so basically him and this other guy who works at like a car wash i I immediately thought of uh, Otis from Henry working at the kind of car uh, gas station everything. He kind of works at this gas station and he's just like seems like very almost like I want to say a socially socially outcast for sure and this guy and him commit all these robberies but they always per, uh, commit these rapes and if it's a Katsu movie so the exact scenes are going to be really long very fetish like uh, very kind of explicit as much as Japan could be without showing actual nudity or penetration because I mean they show breast and, and, and some things but they can't show the pubic region of course so um as, as the movie progresses it's a very short like 70 minutes or so these two continue their exploits and and at one point it, it took a weird turn where these these characters introduced in the very beginning and i was not sure what their uh their mo's were um because there's kind of these two big bruisers and younger like handsome looking almost feminine character and i was like and it almost looks like the the feminine character is talking to one of the guys and the bigger guy says well don't worry we'll find him and you're like oh, are these guys after these guys because of the maybe they rape someone they love but it looks like one guy leans in for a kiss and i'm just like i'm not sure what this is about because 1977 you know and a homosexual character in japan and this kind of movie you're like i don't if that's what was happening it's kind of a little vague there but as it progresses um this this character seems to be searching for our main kind of baddie here for kind of sexual reasons and that was a curveball in the film to me i was like oh that's so weird and different and i didn't expect that and i didn't expect the ending either there's kind of like a revenge element here and uh some brutality and um some necrophilia which kind of was like oh shit shit like it gets darker and weirder than i ever expected it to go like you, you kind of expect the typical rape fetish stuff and you're like okay that's gonna be typical you know what i mean in these things but as it went on i was like i didn't expect the violence in that term like that kind of violence at that ending in that kind of way and i i definitely gave it points for surprise on that end and you know kind of the the downbeat tone of it at the very end like there's an artistic rape i don't want to say that. i mean i don't know how else to explain it i mean it, it you know how like somebody would explain like a dario movie is an artistic murder well there's pillow feathers of all places like on the nose like if you were to think like you know like <laughs> whatever you know um so so that happens uh but there's also this element where they kind of show like this look into like i would say like the kind of you know i don't want to say anonymous sex scene in in japan but this place where couples will go kind of like you know the the um, you know the old kissing like hill or something in america kissing hill that's you know what i mean though like right the lookout point and everybody makes out there and, and like there's this area where these people kind of like it reminds me of like a stranger by the lake that film where they have the hookup area of all the the gay hookups but this isn't like a, a gay area where it's like couples kind of go off and they have sex in this wooded area and um one of the rapes actually happens there where uh one of the kind of um the the kind of 
small like the dumber guy the guy who's under like following him kind of goes into that area but like there's definitely like statements made about like society and how this character is and outcast and everything like that and how he admires this like this kind of horrible piece of shit and everything like that but it's it's a crazy weird movie and uh i i would recommend it for fans of this kind of stuff and like i said um there's so much like focus on american extreme cinema like people get so upset and i i know i'm beating a dead horse because i was talking about this like they'll be like oh, i can't believe serbian film is this crazy and this disturbing or 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 cannibal holocaust but those have definite reasons why there's a subject matter within those but even i spit on your grave or last house on the left gets this hyper focus on there because the movies are effective in what they do and they bother people and there's so much like when people just hyper focus on those kind of those two movies or something like that it just shows the lack of depth that they've seen when it comes to extreme or genre cinema or this kind of stuff like this like um japan was regularly making movies in the 70s and even the 60s and, and 80s that were just like these are nasty i mean like tonally and just the stuff they have in there is obviously very bothersome and, and could upset some people so it's just weird like when i mean like anybody that's dived into like the extreme or the underground or even horror uh, dive into watching 50 60 movies for one year you start to see like well all these other countries are doing it and just people haven't seen these movies or not aware of these movies and it's just they haven't hit the mainstream so they most people don't talk about them like and it just shows you if they really really had like uh, I don't want to be, I sound like a, um, a elitist or something here. Like, and I'm talking about like 1970s rape Japan movies, but I'm just saying it's not an elitist attitude. It's just a strange attitude of how upset people get up in arms about a couple movies because they don't know the vast genre or whatever. So anyways, I, I thought this was, uh, um, it's, it's, I, 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 it's that point, right? When you cover like extreme exploitation movies where you're like, I would recommend this. I think this is a good film, but at the same time, this is very bothersome to so many people, but for what it is, I think it's good. And I will stand by that. So, I mean, it is what it is. It's, it's kind of hard. There's so much out there now where people go to review, uh, hardcore horror films or exploitation films and people tend to forget that a big part of this the genre is disturbing or horrifying or upsetting stuff and a lot of that can be sexualized and be bothersome to people and i understand that it's not for everybody but it does take me back a little bit when you you go to a website or something that's supposed to be dedicated to the extreme or hardcore and everybody's like i can't believe and they're so upset by it it's just like well isn't that kind of the what they're doing i mean it's this piece of its product of its time and everything but it is what it is uh this one uh the nakatsu erotic films are not for everybody Everybody. This is one on the, the seedy, sleazy side, but I feel like it has a tone that uh, will attract people that are into like kind of the nihilistic horror stuff of the 70s, the American kind of style thing. So yeah, um, that is Assault the 13th Hour, aka Rape the 13th Hour, and be warned, obviously it has sexual assault and rape and all that kind of stuff that uh, most people are appalled by when they watch a movie. Okay, continuing your pervert card block. Um, I decided to watch the the series of film by uh, the, the series of films by uh, it's a series it's three a trilogy of films by Kazu Okamazu, um, who basically had been writing I think since the late '60s. I think he did Go Go Second Time Virgin, which I still need to watch. It's on the, it's on the list to watch. But uh, he directed a slew of like 20 movies. Um, I covered Gozu the the thing Forsaken by God, which isn't really sexually explicit, but his entrails movies are, and this is. Entrails of a Virgin from 1986. It's relatively short. Um, what is the runtime? 73 minutes. So yeah, this is from Synapse under their Asian cult cinema collection that they used to have. They put all their stuff out like Battle uh, Girl, which was by the same director from 91. Really entertaining, cool movie. A, a kind of an action zombie film. And Organ, which I still need to watch. And, and a slew of others. And one coming up that will. So the Asian cult cinema collection was pretty cool from uh, Synapse. They had lots of crazy stuff on there. Um, and this was actually a Nakatsu erotics film as well. But they put it, it was before they were releasing that line. So, Entrails of a Virgin. So, um, this one had like, it had a big reputation. Like, if you go on Letterboxd, I'm looking at the reviews after I watched it. I always do that. I'm like, I really like this, but I got to rate it. And I'm like, oh, everybody hates this. Everybody finds this trashy and gross and just, and like, I feel like this one's getting a little bit more attention than a lot of the other ones because it had the release and the title and the case is just like, oh, wow, it takes you back. So, and I understand why people don't like this if they haven't seen any of the other Nakatsu movies. Like, Nakatsu movies, they literally have 
have like 20, 30 minutes of softcore sex. Of course, they don't actually show the penetration, but they go with a full fetish, full weird shit kind of going on here. So essentially, um, we kind of have the same plot of Blood Tracks from 1985. If anybody's seen that one, um, a Scandinavian slasher that's kind of in line with The Hills Have Eyes, where we have a rock band uh, music group going to make a music video and they run into like a clan of like cannibal, like wild men that uh, and they have a big fight. Now, this doesn't happen necessarily like that, but we have that setup, right? It's kind of a, a cabin in the woods kind of story to like the Evil Dead, but and that I only brought that movie up because it actually is kind of like a photography group going out to shoot some pictures of these models and everything like that. And we have like the two, uh, we have the producer, the photographer, three models, and kind of like a helper. Um, and all the guys in this movie are, are complete and utter dog shit, like literally. Like we have in the very beginning, we see like the photographer kind of like sleeping with a couple of the women and and like whispering sweet nothings and just saying things and like treating them horrible. And all the sex scenes are filled like uh, filmed and made really uncomfortable. The women clearly are not into it, just like a lot of stuff like going on. And it's just like, oh, this is really uncomfortable. And like you get the idea, like the exploitative nature of the model, uh, you know, industry and film industry, all that kind of shit. So essentially what happens is the group is driving through the thick, thick fog, super atmospheric and their van and they can't go any further. So they decide to stop at this random cabin that they find and uh, some creature. I'm not necessarily sure why he awakens. The, they call him a creature because he has like a deep mellowing voice, but it's really just a guy covered in mud and he seems to have a giant dick. And this starts kind of a thing that is in all three of these movies, like all three of the um, the entrails movies where like you, you obviously can't show the dick. And uh, so basically you'll see like a shadow dick that's like weirdly shaped with a giant head and like form shadow. And sometimes the, sh the shadow dick will, you know, obviously penetrate somebody, but it, it's not necessarily like <laughs> you could clearly tell it's like a fake dick and or like it's not necessarily sh a shadow, but it'll be like shadowed or sh a shadow dick. Shadow dick. That should be a, <laughs> should be a movie shadow dick. Or it'll be like in the shadows because you barely make it out and it's just like obviously a prop dick. But there's a lot of that, okay? A lot of creatures with weird genitals and dicks and all that kind of stuff here. So essentially what happens is about 20, 30 minutes we get into this movie before like the creature starts to pick people off. And, and it's a gore film. It's a gore slasher picking them off and, and having sexual stuff with, it, with the characters as much as it can. Um, but the kills are really good and you're always happy when one of the guys gets killed because they're absolute dog shit. Um, somebody gets uh, their eyes popped out. That was fun. And, and there's lots of weird kind of editing techniques and stuff. Well, not, I don't even call them techniques, just editing choices. Like, well, they'll like cut to like somebody being hit in the head with a hammer and then they'll cut to like somebody hitting meat or shit like that. Like, it's just very common in all three of these movies, especially the first two where that kind of stuff happens. But I, I ended up really enjoying this one. It, it's, and I like these movies because like, yes, they're, they're messages is like the film, the photography stuff, and it is obviously some sleaze bags and trash bags out there doing this kind of shit. But then, like, it's done in like 70 minutes and it's over and out. And, like, you've seen as, and, and like these Nakatsu movies and watching Asian films and like extreme films and horror films that are just kind of pushing the buttons kind of kind of ruined my, my like expectation at a lot of movies because I'll sit down and be like, all right, we got 80 minutes. What's going to happen? And, like, these 80 minute movies, a lot of times will pack in, they, they're not all good, don't get me wrong, but they'll pack in so much shit. Like, this is like, I've I've seen like five sex scenes. I've seen six murders and a monster with a giant dick. And it's all in 73 minutes. You can't beat that. Like, I don't, I don't know if these are selling points or just me like being crazy and sick and weird. Like, and I get that. Like, these movies are made for a special audience, right? Like, and I can understand people like, this is just a bunch of softcore sex with a monster killing people. It's like, well, it is what it is. And some people like it. Some people don't. Um, and, and like, it dits into some real gnarly stuff too. Like I think like that people are just watching this for extreme gore are going to be kind of disappointed, right? Because, but there is a couple scenes there like the hammer that's like over the top splatter, but then we have somebody like reaching up inside someone was pretty grotesque. But yeah, anyways, it, it's got a lot of atmosphere. It's, it's got um, as many sex scenes as it does kills. And there's only six characters in the movie. So like, yeah, a anyways, I enjoyed it. There is an interview with the director and I did watch that on this one. It's about 15 minutes long and he seems to be a strange fellow. Uh, is an understatement. He's kind of funny. And the interview is kind of like, it seems like they're just kind of having fun with the whole thing, to be honest, and and everything like that. And he's just like, how long was this? 20, 30 years? And I think it was initially made in like 2002 or something, the DVD. Anyways, uh, yeah, Entrails of a Virgin. It would be nice. I don't know what these were made on. I'm sure film. Um, but 
it would be nice to see maybe remastered Blu-rays if they have the elements or something like that because I think these movies have somewhat of a following and it's kind of sad that Synapse put out the first two but not the third one and the third one had like a shock DVD which I do not have and, and, and everything like that which I would have liked to pick up but I, I do not have it but yeah so anyways in Trails of a Virgin if it sounds like it's up your alley check it out the title alone is very explicit enough to be like whoa and that's probably why I have always had it and I was just like I don't know what to expect in that but uh I, I just eased in, not even eased in. I, I've been watching a lot of the Asian cinema for like the last eight years and I've been really enjoying it and I just need to start watching more and more. And I, I mean, just kind of watching, checking off the list on a lot of stuff. So yeah. Okay, next up on the list, again, directed by Kazu Okamazu, um, or Kazu, whatever, you guys know my pronunciation skills, is Entrails of a Beautiful Woman. And you know what? I I'm sitting here thinking about it. Um, this one has a runtime of 68 minutes. And I don't know which one I prefer. I mean, like, I like the, the atmosphere of the first movie, Entrails of a Virgin, but I feel like this one, the revenge storyline, is, is way more up my alley and everything like that, especially after watching so many, like, strange kind of Asian revenge movies i love revenge films they're they're one of my favorite kind of things in a film to have so entrails of a beautiful woman i think like well watching this again i was just like taken back at how crazy and and mean-spirited the fucking thing was like in the first five minutes we have like a brutal gang rape yakuza like uh rape this girl and they're telling her basically you came looking for your sister and you made a huge mistake we sold your sister into slavery sex slavery in africa and we're going to do the same thing to you they inject her with this weird new drug that messes her up she manages to escape and she runs into this doctor and explains everything that happened to her while she's all messed up and it seems like she's kind of changing like something going through her leg like a, a vein popping and like they do this effect on the people that have taken this drug where they take like obviously hot air or something air and push it on their skin and they just do it really fast in different areas to make it look like their their body's kind of more it's a really kind of very simple but clever technique to use so essentially what happens is she tells this doctor her entire story and then commits suicide uh, very sadly this doctor takes it upon her herself to get revenge on this uh, Yakuza gang that she has the information she has and the Yakuza gang's filled with random people one was her boyfriend uh, this girl's boyfriend's uh, this girl's sister's boyfriend that kind of screwed them all over those two and she starts to kind of track him and manipulate the situation but uh, things don't go necessarily the way that she wants them to and she ends up becoming a victim of this gang too but this drug again is used in crazy ways and what happens to her is she becomes this crazy monster that carries out this revenge the revenge is uh, fairly violent but very quick um you know somebody's head gets knocked off in super gory detail um somebody gets folded in half and i don't spoil everything but this monster has some sexual organs as well and uh yeah it gets pretty wild uh there's a lot of sex of course there's a like, gang bang which was a couple gang bangs and the one gang bang i was just kind of shocked they did this thing of course there's a, a female character who's involved with the gang and um she's probably just as twisted as they are and um she has this this thing where she is the the woman's getting raped and she's she forces the lady to start giving her oral sex and i was just like man we're going some places in this one i just was like i don't know if i've ever seen that but maybe if i did i just forgot it on purpose but i was just like yeah this this stuff's pretty explicit um very sexualized and all that kind of stuff and and uh there's some good nightmare fuel in here a monster knocking on your door holding the skin uh the back the skin back of a yakuza gang member pretty memorable um the monster looks really gnarly although his eyes are like constantly open like a teeth and it's just like anyways i just like it. it's a rape revenge movie and it's in the meanest sense right but it's also a monster killing people in a way so it's just like ah i really i really am i really dig these they're, and again they're short they're nasty they're crazy they're weird and uh, i guess they're stimulating in a negative way and positive way anyways entrails of a beautiful woman um there's another interview with the director on this one i didn't watch this one because i, I was in a cram spot and i was like well i can watch this interview that's 20 minutes or i can i can watch uh rusted guts um part three so i decided to watch the third part of the series instead i know i know half-assed mr parka again excuse king time crunch time crunch and i'm not feeling well let's use that as an excuse yeah anyways uh entrails of a virgin and entrails of a beautiful girl i i'm sure these dvds are out of print but i'm sure you could track them down somewhere um yeah anyways good stuff okay and the third and final of this series is rusted body guts of a virgin part three and it has another name too like sexual inquisitor and 
and I guess that title would probably fit a little bit more. Now, this one is like, you know, how everybody would call like movies. This is torture porn. This is torture porn. Uh, this is legit torture porn. Literally, they are torturing people through sex in this kind of weird fetish kind of way. So it's like, I guess this counts as torture porn. So this one is probably the least horror oriented, I would say. The other two have these monster or slasher elements, and I feel like they fit more firmly in the horror. This one kind of is more a sci-fi sex weird thing. Still like torture and all that kind of stuff so in the beginning we have like a, a quartet of people and they refer to one as grandpa and the granddaughter and i just don't really know the real relationship between these four but you get right in the beginning they are torturing someone and they say where's the 120 million yen and they're 160 million yen and they're torturing him and they're tearing off fingernails and doing these sexual things to him and uh when they go down on his start torturing him in a certain extreme way he ends up giving them information but it leads them to a bank teller or somebody who runs a bank has actually stolen more of the money than they thought so they decide to put their focus on this person and they're going to any means necessary to get this money from this person through these weird sexual tricks and all sorts of crazy stuff like that and torture but also there's this element of where the grandfather has built this machine that's very much like strange days if anybody's seen strange days with um who else? Who's the main star in that? I remember Vincent D'Onofrio and uh, Vincent Gallo, I think. And I can't, it's been a long time since I watched Strange Days. But they have this thing where you can put it on their something on their head and you put it on somebody else's head and kind of feel what they're feeling. Also Demolition Man, kind of where you put the element on them and you can have this weird sexual thing that they have. So it's kind of like that, where these characters are having sex but then on this weird bed of like prongs that are and then like somebody can put it on and experience the sex through them it's very strange it's very weird and this is going to be implemented in their torture schemes and all that kind of stuff again we have the shadow dick which I would refer to like people having sex behind a sheet and you see this big rod sticking up and people going down on it all that kind of stuff um, the main torture is pretty crazy at the very end I mean it's very you know a sex scene with a tourniquet that's all I'll leave at this one is not as gory as the other ones the murders aren't really as explicit and uh there's not there's not that many murders if i get into even i feel like they do kill people but it's kind of just like we grind up them and show some meat being ground up and then their pigs feed so it's not as a you know i feel like it, it's a little bit different than the other two i feel like it doesn't really fit this was made in 87 um which is crazy to think that this guy he made Boom, he made uh, Entrails of a Virgin, Entrails of a Beautiful Woman, and Gozu, The Thing Forsaken by God, all in 1986. That That's intense. And this one, 87, the dude's got a bunch of movies. I'll have to check out some more of his stuff as well. So, like, this one I thought was was good. It just didn't, it didn't, it didn't uh, interest me as much as the other ones. Because the other ones got a monster. Like, I'm a monster guy, so it's like, it's like they incorporated every weird thing I like in a movie and had, like, the perversity, too, in the first two. It's like, well, you got your weird kind of, like, uh, weird sex things going on and stuff in a movie, and then we had a fucking monster, and the third, the second one, Beautiful Woman, had a revenge story, so I'm like, and a good bad guy, so I'm like, this this is the kind of shit I eat up. Like, it's, it's like all the kind of weird little elements that I enjoy all, but this one is good, and we're seeking out if you're interested in this kind of stuff, but I... I would say watch Virgin and Beautiful Woman, but this one is different. I mean, like, the people are attractive in the film, too. Like, the, the people that are, like, all the sex stuff. But, I mean, a lot of it is, like, torturous sex stuff and, and weird fetish stuff. Although some of it is kind of a condone. Like, I mean, it's strange. But we also add the element of the gang kidnapping the uh, guy's wife and having her be involved and showing that the husband cheated and that's actually a pretty good scene where she's like forced to watch her husband cheat on her on a video and kind of like just completely be like broken and you feel really bad for her so so like it has some nice touches to it and some weird uh stuff as well like all these movies have something strange going on that's worth watching so that is uh rusted body entrails of a, guts of a virgin three aka uh female or inquisitor or sexual inquisitor something along those lines i know there was a shock dvd years ago and i believe shock was either a german or japanese company they at one point released men behind the sun and they had some other ones like my bloody guts or my bloody angel man i have a couple of these sitting on the shelf blurp i think blurp was one of them too maybe i'll take a quick shot of them and show you when i'm talking about them but uh yeah anyways um i'd like to see some more of these crazy japanese movies get released um otherwise they're kind of just watching bootlegs or, or you know watching them online and it's funny like you search youtube and like you'll pull up the guinea pig movies you're like why is guinea pig on youtube when when i got a, a freaking strike down for showing like side boob like but there's just like watching this this woman get her eyeball popped out with a fucking spoon YouTube is all crazy when it comes to that shit. So anyways, uh, yeah, let's uh, move on to the next one.
Okay, the next one on the pervert card is, geez, this one's so perverse, I can't even show you the front of the cover, the whole cover. But there is some side boob for you guys. That might might be a copyright or whatever, not copyright, but taken down. This is Maniac Driver. And I picked this up at Wasteland. I have some of that shrink wrap on there still. And this is by Karando. I always mispronounce his last name. Is it Mits, Mitsu, uh, Mits something? I don't want to butcher his name. But I was very excited. That I had a lot of hype seeing this one. I was super excited about it. Um, I am a fan of his films. He did Gunwoman, which I absolutely love when it came out. Great movie. Maybe I'll rewatch it for this channel. I know, I know when we had the old Shut Up Brandon podcast, me, Brandon, and Dustin all loved it. it we all thought it was the greatest thing ever. Um, and uh, he did Gunwoman was his first directed film. And then he went on to do uh, Event Blind Samurai. Um, which I, I, I liked in some parts and, and didn't love, but he cried to kill, which was really cool. And now he's done Maniac Driver. And I've heard Carando on podcast. I know he popped up on David Gibson's podcast, Sadistic Cinema, I think it's called. And he was talking about his influence and everything like that, from like Taxi Driver to Giallos. So I was like, oh, wow, this is totally up my alley just by influences alone. And um, Carando's movies are very, like, very stylized. And, and like, it's, it's a lot of stylized sex, a lot of stylized murder in the movie. So so, like, right away I'm watching this movie, and we're basically following a taxi driver, a la taxi driver, right? And he has, like, obviously mental problems. We find out that his wife was murdered in front of him. He couldn't save her by a motorcycle killer. And uh, basically now he's searching out the perfect woman to murder because he wants this, this person, the person who would lose their lover, to feel the same way he felt in this kind of weird way he becomes infatuated with this woman and kind of has his focus on her so it has like the elements of taxi driver right the obsession the delusions of grandeur all this kind of weird shit but also it has like a jalo touch because he has these flashes where he's imagining these weird kind of moments and everything like that where they'll have like a samurai showdown in the room and did i mention like all the colors in here are very jalo like so we'll have these bright reds these bright blues these bright greens all this kind of stuff is super stylized obvious a love runner to like i would say like uh, Deep Red and On, like Deep Red, Phenomenon, Suspiria, Inferno, those kind of brightly colored kind of crazy stylized Gialli. It's definitely in that kind of vein. But like just watching this, you can see all these influences in here. I see the motorcycle killer. I'm like, oh, Night night Killer or Welcome to Spring Break or What Have You Done to Our Daughters? All this kind of shit. And then like you see the taxi driver and you think taxi hunter, taxi driver. And, and then like also on that aspect, you see like some of the sexualized kind of stuff where they have like the fetish moments of the women showering for long periods of times and I immediately think Nakatsu erotic films or, or pinky films or all those kind of films like that or even like Sato movies or, or stuff like Asian films like He Lives by Night like is it He Lives by Night I can't think of the one that I watched for 85 um, it was a really cool movie where like it was like a, a stalker killer I, I it's either He Lives by Night or, or something along those lines I, I feel like I'm mixing maybe at two movies but like it has that kind of influence of like these kind of Japanese like stalker thriller horror films that have like the sexual exploit. So this is totally made for me. It's also like 70 minutes too. So I love the runtime. The music cut kicks in. It's very memorable music. Some of it kind of has a guitar riff, kind of in that vein of like latter day Argento stuff, like the, the, the phenomenon or opera stuff like that too. So like, yes, it does. You could tell it's obviously more low budget than that kind of stuff in, in a lot of ways. But at the end of the day, I really enjoyed it. There is some, some decent gore effects for sure. There's a lot of nudity. And since it was made in Japan, but this release was an American release by real gore, which is coming back real gore had a handful of titles they put out like dr wolfenstein what was that one dr hackenstein or wolfenstein they had a bunch they also had the violent shit remake which is terrible but the rest of their releases were all worth watching including mask which is a cool kind of giallo thing so hopefully those get re-releases now that they're putting more stuff out but it's coming out from real gore and i, I like that because i like to see this company and this is a good fit for them um, so like it was made in Japan, filmed in Japan with Japanese actors and all that kind of and actresses and all that kind of shit. But it, this is American release, so it doesn't blur out the genital stuff. And, and there's a lot of nudity, a lot of sexual stuff going on in here. Um, but it's, it's a very stylized movie. It's not going to be for everybody. But um, like you can see Karanda wears his influences on his sleeves. And, and I dig that. And there's so many influences in here. A lot of people will dig this one. Um, the music is good. And the ending is pretty crazy. Pretty wild movie. Wouldn't mind uh, watching uh, some more by Carando. I know he's working on more movies, but if you take a look at the back, you can just see all these different colors and everything like that. We have a making of, an audio commentary with 
the uh, with uh, Mits, Mitsutaki, I believe is how you say the name, and we have the soundtrack, which is definitely get to what you're what you're gonna want to listen to because it's pretty cool. But as far as subtitles, it's in Japanese, but it's subtitles. I only mention this for anybody that's listening um, from a different country. They have English, French, and Spanish. So I just showed the 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 side boob there with the nipple, a cartoon nipple. But hey, like I said again, I make the joke. You can watch like Devil's Devil's Experiment on YouTube. No no block, but I show a side nipple. I'm done. Anyways, uh, really happy to see that one. Was very happy to pick that up. I picked that up at Cinema Wasteland, so it's not going to be my update. But I definitely picked it up at Wasteland at, at the Diabolic table, and I was happy to grab it. One of the, right when I saw it, I was like, "Yep, gotta have that. Can't can't live without uh, Maniac Driver." Uh, yeah, great title too. And anyways, uh, love to see more like this. And uh, I see after watching Gun Woman, um, I, I'm gonna watch Carando every movie he makes until he makes like 30 bad movies in a row, which won't happen. So I won't have to worry about that. So anyways, uh, yeah, good stuff. Check it out. Okay, this next one here, um, I picked up at Wasteland as well. And uh, this is a short kind of fake snuff film or faux snuff film. I don't never really know which way to call it. But uh, this is by a, a director, a new director called uh, Brandon Terry. And it's called Deviant. It's about a 20 minute long movie and I've heard him on podcast and I actually got to hang out with him a little bit on the weekend. Really nice guy on the wasteland weekend. Really cool guy, but uh, deviant. So yeah. Anyways, like I said, um, I know like the fake kind of snuff stuff like August underground and, and like hearing him on podcasts, like I, I heard him talk about his movie beforehand and like, um, and he mentioned that his big inspirations were like August Underground, but Agony by Ryan Logston, which I have seen, which is kind of the uh, inspired by August Underground. I know Ryan, good guy. So anyways, like the thing is, so, so I put this in and right off the bat, we start off with entering the house. If anybody's ever seen August underground, like we kind of enter this normality, the point of view camera stuff. And, uh, and we hear the screaming and we know like right when they're going to the basement, we're going to see somebody tortured. And it's like the same opening from August underground, obviously it kind of inspired or lifted. I don't want to say lifted because it's obviously a homage or a love letter to it. And, and throughout the movie, we kind of just have these, these moments of these two killers kind of just like torturing people or killing people. But then we, kind of cut to their modane life of just having basic conversation about work and things like that and like skateboarding and, and that's kind of where that element stuff is there you know what i mean like it's the modane with the violent kind of back and forth thing a lot of people like that that's kind of like a lot of things that people say the power of august underground is it's like one second you're at this little miniature town the next second you're watching a couple people be murdered um so, so it's kind of got that going on but the one thing that i think this movie adds besides having the agony elements as well like the um the the i guess i'll say the park or the you know the um, play set kind of scene which i won't spoil completely is obviously inspired by some Something like agony um those elements it has um something that i would add like a layer of this feels like if people who are obsessed with august underground became killers themselves and occasionally i'm not saying all horror fans become killers of course but there has been a couple incidences where horror fans have become murderers or people that like horror movies become murderers and i don't think it's because they like horror films why they're murderers but people that are obsessed with horror and stuff and it's you know it's it's not correlation or causation it's just core you know what i mean you guys know what i'm saying but there's this element here that these two obviously are hardcore film fans and they're like kind of carrying out their own version of august underground if you would so like if you're into that kind of stuff the fake snuff movies it it's like 20 minutes and it packs in a lot of like a lot of kind of extreme kind of stuff in here some murder of course and and all that kind of stuff like rape but um there is some stuff with some fetuses and uh kind of a, a james bell scene i'll leave it at that you can tell james bell obviously probably did some of the effects in here i imagine a little fetus was a james bell effect but so so if this sounds like it's something up your alley if you're into the extreme or anything like that then check it out they do pack a lot of carnage in 20 minutes so yeah uh check it out i'll be looking forward to more of his movies um and i i will find a link for you to purchase it i picked it up like i said from james bell's table at wasteland so like uh yeah check it out it's called deviant okay the next one up is another one i picked up at wasteland and this is directed by lucky seretti Another guy I hung out with for a bit at Wasteland, really nice guy, really friendly. So I say this stuff because, you know, like meeting the people and hanging out with them and, and stuff like that adds like a layer of kind of seeing where their movies come from and everything like that. So like, just like kind of be, you know what I mean? Like, so like, yeah, so this is Uncle Sleezo's Toxic and Terrifying TV Hour. 
And I had heard a couple people cover this one before, and uh, they, they were pretty high on it. I think Sick on Cinema was the podcast that really dug this one. And uh, I know that uh, Lucky Serretti has done a couple more movies before this, Kindness of Strangers, which is a short, and Freak, which I think is getting a wild eye release down the line. I actually have a copy from Wasteland. So um, what, what happens is, okay, so uh, Uncle Sleezos, I'll call it Uncle Sleezos now because that's a mouthful, is an anthology horror film. And you guys know how I feel. Like, I always say this about anthologies. Like, I obviously made a couple anthologies, so I am a fan. But if the same group of filmmakers is making the entire anthology of a couple people that are working closely together and stuff like that, I feel like it's much better than, like, you grab this one, you grab this one from a bunch of filmmakers, and you try to tie it together. Those always seem weird tonally. They never really match, um, if that makes any sense for anybody. So this one is made by the same group of people. It's just, like, three filmmakers, including Lucky. I can't think of all their names. But this one is also not like you're just three shorts or and an, antho- an, an anthology host. The wraparound's pretty fun. It's kind of in the vein of a... Um, 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 what's, what's the word? Um, WNUF Halloween special or something like that. Right. Where like they're popping in a V or they get the watch, the kid gets to watch television and kind of, this is what he's watching. Right. Um, so essentially we have three shorts and a bunch of fake trailers and everything and advertisements in between. So the first short is kind of done in like an old, like kind of classic werewolf fifties. My, I was a teenage werewolf kind of style thing. This one is okay. Um, it, it's kind of like, uh, I believe it is a, kind of like a black and white made to look like really kind of old and everything like that. My memory is trash bags, but uh, I thought this was uh, a solid kind of short, decent, had some decent makeup effects and everything like that. Um, I thought this was probably my least favorite, but it doesn't mean it's not effective or anything like that. They definitely changed it and tried to make it look different and shot it in a certain way and everything like that. So, uh, yeah, but um, so, so like we have a bunch of these trailers too, like in these weird kind of like advertisements and everything like that in between all the segments. And I don't want to spoil the one that I thought was brilliant, but I'm pretty sure anybody that watches this knows that one of these is fairly brilliant. And it, it's really macabre and morbid done in the style of a nineties, like really crummy toy commercial. And I thought it was absolutely hilarious and dead on being somebody that grew up in the nineties and liked that kind of knew that stuff at the back, like everything like it. Right. Me and Jeremy had that conversation about those really, the, the dumb Duke, the colors, the popsicle commercial, like how out of whack and weird the nineties commercials were. And this one fits that, but it, it's a strange place set and the detail to this play set is insanely funny it's super morbid super morbid and the kids are very excited about it and i thought it was great i had to watch it a couple times and it's just a brilliant little scene in there and i think it's it's kind of one of the shining moments in here um so so the second short is kind of like um more kind of like a um, mysticism kind of like deal where this woman goes to get her palm read and she's told that her her soulmate has actually died so like it kind of messes this whole thing up for her and she becomes kind of like haunted by it and there's like a twist at the very end and there's a reveal this one i thought was pretty good pretty solid short in there um interesting um again we cut to more commercials more gags more funny moments and everything like that that i think are really well done and funny and then the final short the final short was the one that kind of uh won me over for the movie for me to i i liked it i enjoyed it and then the final one was like that's a really good short it's a really solid short really creepy genuinely scary and it, it's more something that scares me like of course like the middle one a lot of people are scared of like ghosts and kind of hauntings and stuff that doesn't do so much for me but the kind of shit in the third one and it's kind of in the vein of um what was the movie change a life changer if i'm not mistaken that came out a couple years ago i and i don't spoil everything but essentially we have this kind of guy jogging and he's kind of going through his daily routine or nightly routine his just his routine he gets home and he hears this strange knock on the door and when he answers it there's a very strange person he witnessed on the road earlier and this person starts talking and right when they open their mouth it is genuinely creepy as shit they don't sound right and what happens is terrifying and that's and i'll leave it at that but i think this is the most i guess you'll say like lovecraftian or science science fiction horror just uh, a, a genuinely scary ass concept and it works really well and this kind of concept always wins me over this one i also thought had the best special effects there's a nice little chess special effect in here that i thought was really well done but but uh, like I said, the only bad thing about covering anthologies is by the end of it, you realize all you do is talk about the shorts. And you don't really give that much insight on anything. And it you feel like you did a shitty job on the review. But uh, yeah, as far as the special features are concerned, which I did check some out, commentary Lucky Serretti and Matthew Swordson, um, who is one of the other filmmakers as well. Uh, Leslie Dame is the other one who worked on it, who made the movie. Then we have outtakes and bloopers, Dahmer's apartment playset tour, and more. And I should take that back about not really.
really having a wraparound in the general sense because there is a wraparound. There is Uncle Sleezo who is running, but, you know, he comes back and he always talks. He's kind of like your crypt keeper and everything like that, and he's kind of having a good time. He's an older guy and, and whatnot, the whore host and everything like that. So it's done in the whore host kind of style with commercials and stuff and trailers and everything like that. But if you're interested in that one, I think it's, what was the company? It's dead vision, dead vision is it? dead vision, uh, productions. They have a couple other ones. I'll put a link below. Um, yeah, some, some fun puppets, some animation, some gooey, gory face clown cop is one that I think will stand out for people. But anyways, check out uncle Sleezo's, uh, I have to look at the title toxic and terrifying TV hour. Yeah. That's a mouthful again. So anyways, check it out. Okay, the next one here. I'm going to be kind of brief because I just watched the UHD. I didn't actually watch all the features. I did a piss poor job. But this is Dead Heat from, uh, what is this, 88, if I'm not mistaken. I know it's the late 80s, 88. Uh, directed by Mark Goldblatt. Is it Goldblatt? Yeah, Goldblatt, who directed The Punisher from the 80s, which I, I think is find it kind of enjoyable with Lou Gossett Jr. and Dolph Lundgren. Dead Heat, um, 4K from Vinegar Syndrome, starring Treat Williams, Joe Pescapone, of course, um, Darren McGavin, Vincent Price, um, some other stuff. Steve Johnson effects, which are the highlight of the fucking movie, let me say this. So uh, Mark Goldblatt was a, a editor, long-term editor, did editing on a lot of bigger films, and I, he did a couple directed film so so dead heat is a movie on paper like you're like uh why like basically criminals can't die it's up to treat williams and joe pescabone to take out the the criminals and figure out everything like and there's a lot of gooey special wild effects and you're like this is perfect this is exactly on paper it's a five-star movie for me but then when i watch it i always feel like it's good it's just not as good as i always re want it to be and stuff like that um so anyways um in the very beginning there's this awesome like uh robbery where these these two criminals steal all these jewels and they're running out and they have this big shootout with the cops it's really chaotic a bunch of cops get shot the criminals are getting lit up with a bunch of bullets they're not dying and treat williams and joe pescabone do some wild things to take them out including a crazy car crash stunt which i thought was awesome of course the chief is livid in any movie with a cop action buddy cop movie the, the chief is always mad he's always yelling he's always screaming that's not any different here so uh essentially what happens is these two cops are basically looking into what's causing this they end up like leading them to this place where they realize these two guys have been dead before they had an autopsy performed on them and all that kind of stuff and it leads them somehow they were pumped full of this chemical they go to this place and they start to this movie is really fast paced in a lot of ways almost like it seems like it's missing a little bit they end up at this chemical place and they figure out that maybe this company is behind it because they have to fight this three faced monster which is fucking awesome again effects by Steve Johnson anyways what happens is we have uh, some some tragedy strikes and we have a zombie cop situation here and one of them is a zombie cop and basically he's rotting and he only has a certain amount of time to figure out who's behind this whole damn thing and there's some people that pop out that you think they find out are no good kind of obvious especially um and vincent price is supposedly this dead guy that used to run this company and you see him on the tape and all that kind of stuff but uh there's a really fun scene in this kind of i think chinese restaurant where all these things come to life like a wild like a pig comes to life and all these weird food particles come to life and it has a has a professor um uh, who's the guy from uh um, freaking running man is in here as a goon uh professor um geez uh Ta tamanaro or something like that but he's in here as a goon sub-zero plane zero you guys remember uh running man of course so uh, so anyways yeah it, it's got a lot of wild special effects that steal the show and it, and i really think that's the highlight of the movie i mean treat williams is an actor that i think really kind of got the short end of the stick when you watch him and stuff like hair and I loved him in Things to Do Endeavor When You're Dead. I think he's fun in um, Deep Rising. I know my friend Derek would, would bring up I Want Those Skulls, which I've not seen The Phantom <laughs> in years, but every time I hear him say that, it makes me laugh. Uh, so, so like, Treat Williams had, like, uh, it was on his way, I feel like, to be somebody, like, really big. I don't know what. Like, I know, like, earlier, what was that? Prince of the City is supposed to be, like, a bigger movie, and he's in that. And I think he, he's even in Once About a Time in America, if I'm not mistaken. Anyways, I just... Don't think Treat Williams hit where he should have. And Joe Pescapone, he's like a comedian, SNL. He's he's all right, you know, in this movie. I, I Obviously, he's not... I don't want to be rude, but he's not really doing the movie any favors, okay? Um, like, yeah... Andrew Dice Clay would have been better. I don't know if he's big at the time. <laughs> You're thinking somebody like that. You know what I'm saying? Um, he's not horrible. He doesn't ruin the movie or anything like that. And it's nice seeing Darren McGavin. I think that like there's two female characters in the movie that kind of, but they look similar. Like at one point I was confused. I was like, what's happening? But I'm, I'm, I'm a dumb dumb with ADHD. So I was just like, I've seen this before. It had been a couple times. And like, I always remembered it being a fun movie. The four, the 4k looks really great. It's kind of insane how good this movie looks. Um, like a, a, you never really like, it's funny. You put in dead heat 
eat and you watch it like this looks amazing and then you put in like a classic movie that hasn't had a restoration you're like why is this this why is this the world we live in but uh i might as well read the features on here that i didn't watch because i'm a piece of shit i think the features are all on the blu-ray they're not on the 4k our archival commentary track with mark goldberg and screenwriter terry black alongside producers michael a metzger and david hepburn i will say that the editing and the action stuff is all perfect like it's not really like a poorly directed movie like directing is not the problem it's, it's probably the script or or company kind of cutting stuff out and everything like that so the building block and it's not a horrible movie i like it but it's just i feel like on paper it's a five star and then it's like a three and a half when i watch it the building blocks of movies a brand new in interview with director mark goldblatt a thousand feet of lighting a brand new interview with visual effects artist ernesto or ernest fernando uh fernino Seizing Opportunity, brand new interview with second unit director Patrick Reed Johnson. How to edit for an editor. A brand new interview with editor Harvey Rosenstock. Happy Accidents Happen, a brand new interview with composer Ernest Trost. Dead and Alive, an archival interview with makeup effects creator Steve Johnson. Still Gallery, original theatrical trailer, TV spot deleted scenes, archival EPK, MF, uh, MF Fed production piece, and all that. So, yeah, it, um, anyways, if you like Dead Heat, I'm happy to see this one. I know it had an image Blu ray and everything, and everybody's like, Where's Dead Heat? New World Pictures here, like we expected, like all slugs got released, Hellraiser, um, a lot of those, uh, Dead End Driving, so we were waiting for Dead Heat, finally got one, happy to see it on Blu-ray, our 4K and Blu-ray from Vinegar Syndrome, so yeah, cool. Okay, the next one is the Patreon pick, and this is, Derek picked this one, Derek B, and he picked Waiting for Guffman. Um, this was directed by the same group that uh, Christopher Guest that made, like, um, The Mighty Wind or Best in Show, um, all those kind of guys like that. And uh, so, so anyways, uh, Waiting for Guffman was one I had never seen. Um, it had a Warner Archive Blu-ray. ended up renting it on uh, Amazon. And, uh, yeah, so... The, the, these guys, their their movies are very funny, but they're like funny in the, like the most realistic, awkward way. I have seen my uh, best in show and stuff like that. So like I don't know how to go about like talking about this movie in general. So we have this small town um, that basically is famous for the stools they make, and we have Christopher Guest who is a super flamboyant like play director and everything like that. And every year I think they put on this big play, and there's essentially going to be this guy who's from this like big uh, theater company um, and Broadway way i think um guffman and he's supposed to visit the town when, before they put on this play and they're kind of trying to wine and dine him to like not basically impress him with this play so they can get on broadway so this essentially just follows all the characters of setting up the play and making it as best as possible and the songs and everything and the cast and crew so it has of course christopher guest in here as the director he's absolutely hilarious we have eugene levy in here and um geez uh katherine o'hara as uh as in here as well they're both brilliant uh, Fred Fred uh, Fred Willard is really funny in this, and uh, Parker Posey, like kind of like the big cast members, and they're absolutely all brilliant. They're all and, and like I do not know, like these are like mockumentary style things where they'll have interviews with the characters you get in their psyche and, and the, who they are, and like it's just such a funny. The things they say are like endlessly quotable, not laugh out loud funny, but they all make you smile. They all make you cringe in that kind of awkward, weird way. I do not know how to explain it to be brutally honest, but it's just this one kind of special kind of humor like of course this is spinal tap is another one christopher guest is in that so like it, it's so much like those movies and like there's a whole line of them and they're all very funny and quotable and i feel like every time you watch it it gets better and better it's the first time watch for me though so like and, and the musical they, they eventually do see the play and like they don't go over the top like they never break the line of realism like i feel like it could be legitimately there like everything that happens in it could happen. So which is like it's genius in that way too. Like they make a joke where they don't want because it's like a period piece in the beginning of the play. Like the the the, the whole history of this town, and like Eugene Levy is supposed to get off uh, this horse and uh, like and he basically like well, we don't want you wearing your glasses because they didn't have glasses back then. And so he takes he's like but I got my I got like a bad this, these glasses correct my vision and he can't see. So like instead of having him like completely fall down and tear down the whole set, they just have him get off the horse at one point in that opening and he's got like cross eyes and just looks like an idiot and stumbles once and like that shit is just very funny but of course the ending i won't spoil what actually happens um but like like christopher guest in this movie is brilliant like he's just over he's just such a weird character and like he's just so funny and he's like so obviously gay but nobody knows he's gay that kind of like the theater director that is just clearly gay but no one knows he's gay or won't bring it up um so there's also other people in here like larry miller pops up here he's the mayor he's also very funny kind of a very good actor there's like a, a lot of little 
other characters that pop up that are really funny too. Parker Posey is brilliant. Like she works at Dairy Queen and she has these long like monologues just talking about Dairy Queen when they ask her a question. She's like, and you know, like I make the blizzards and it's just like such like awkward stuff. And like we have Fred Willard and Catherine O'Hara who are just so oblivious to how bad of actors they are and how, how like they just do not understand like anything. Like they're just, it's just really funny. And I just don't know how to explain it. And like the songs they sing, are legitimately sound like songs you would hear in this kind of play. Like they're not like so fake or so re- they they seem like legitimate works of art. Like for this kind of thing, even though they're so like corny and cringy and bad and just so small town weird mentality is perfect. Like it's a it's a very funny movie. It's very well done. I don't know how much better it could be for what it is. If that makes any sense, that's waiting for Guffman. Great stuff. Okay, guys, we're gonna hop into those 1994 movies. Prison officials say Dahmer's head may have been bashed against a wall. Today, as last-minute appeals failed to stop the execution of America's most notorious mass murderer, John Wayne Gacy. Throughout, Chikatilo presented himself as a wretched victim of nature's indifference. Say the proof. Reality! What do you know about reality? Handling <laughs> It's not a solitary story. This is not reality. Not reality. Not reality. This is reality. The delusion of a disordered mind, a phantom, a spirit, a ghost. Look, he hasn't got any villains, and the coma he's in is irreversible. Give me a signature and I'll pull the plug now. Fuck off. The first one up for 1994 is The Returning. Yes, this is another Hong Kong one, and I'll be kind of brief with this one. The quality I watched was really terrible. I watched it on YouTube. Um, I, th- I think the DVD is probably long out of print, not easy to find. It's not on Yes Age. I can't. I could find it, so I had to watch it on YouTube. Quality is fairly terrible, and it's kind of a strange haunting story. We have like a, a jur- I think he's a, a like a writer, a book writer, and what he wants to do is essentially move into this house where this this person committed suicide, and kind of like write uh, a life story or write something about this character. 100. percent I'm not sure. 100. percent It's kind of like a little muddled, and you know, the, the, you know, stuff like this, like the sound and the stuff. It's just not a perfect way to watch it. So essentially, this writer moves in there has his wife move in there as well and he's like hyper focused on his job he doesn't want to pay attention to her or anything like that they also have a family friend that's kind of getting involved with this whole situation and very quickly she starts to be kind of like weird things around the house being haunted and stuff like that and it just a lot of strange things and and over time it seems like she's kind of being overtaken by this presence of this woman who committed suicide in this house and and some of the people that are involved with the firm have have ties to this character that that um, killed themselves and the husband seems to be infatuated with the the original person and all that kind of stuff plays into there. It reminded me of another movie from 1994 that came out a Hong Kong movie called Fatal Obsession, where a character is possessed by an uh, ancient uh, older person and their their complete attitude changes. Although that one is more horror oriented and more brutal, and some more kind of crazy things happen in there. While this one is, is a lot tamer and it has a lot of drama and stuff like that, it's not necessarily the the most horror oriented movie. Although it's kind of like a tame ghost story, it's decent. I mean, um, it's not poorly acted. Again, I couldn't watch the best quality or anything like that so like i I don't have that much to say about the returning um but it it sounds like it's up your alley make sure you don't watch the return which is another one from 94 i think another asian film and there's a a bunch of movies called the return and the returning so make sure you get the right one uh yeah this is the hong kong flick from 1994 horror kind of romantic ghost story deal so yeah okay and the last one uh, from 1994 is the fox with nine tails 
Yeah, so uh, the Fox Woman, I believe, is some sort of like mythological kind of legend in a lot of countries. So like I'm not familiar with all the details, but like watching stuff like the uh, the like the Great Yokai War and the Yokai Monsters movies, you kind of get the idea. Although this is a Korean film, that South Korean film, that like monsters and other cultures are a little bit different. And I don't know if the, I think the Fox Woman is probably you know a yokai would be considered a yokai. So essentially, the opening of this movie, I did not know what to expect. It's listed as like a fantasy horror romance movie. And I had no idea it was going to be this wild. I was thinking something a little bit more tame, a little bit more subtle in the, the department of fantasy, you know, kind of like maybe the returning. So this starts off and we have this guy being like, we see hell, like it's hell and the train goes through and it's just these weird kind of monsters or semi demon things walking around. And you know, like, I'm like, what am I getting into here? This is bizarre. And they're pulling this guy through everything. And he's like, I, I, I you got the wrong guy. I'm an accountant. And they say, ah, you're up, you're up 69 and you got to go do this. Basically what you have to do is bring back the fox woman or dead or alive or you're done we're killing you you're not getting back yada 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 and this guy is just pleading with them i'm an accountant you got the wrong guy they send him on a train he basically goes up to earth and he has to track down and find this fox woman this fox woman has the last time in a hundred she has a hundred years to try to become human or she's gonna have to go back to hell is my understanding or die or something along those lines she wants to become human so she can you know obviously live and um, whatnot but she needs to make a sacrifice for that to happen uh, in a human disguise she's a beautiful woman and in the very beginning of the movie we have this guy that tries to force sex on her and she says don't do this don't do this and violently kills him bites out his neck has these purple eyes so like we realize that she needs to have this certain set of circumstances to make things work um, also, another character that we enter into the picture is kind of this uh, taxi driver, of course, <laughs> right? A lot of taxi drivers in Asian films. I don't know. Or period. I'm just watching a lot of taxi driver movies. Um, so essentially what happens here is there's this taxi driver that um, is down on his luck. He gets beat up by some goons, stabbed. She ends up finding him and takes pity on him and, and brings him back to health. And they start a relationship. Uh, while at the same time, we have this guy from hell trying to figure everything else out um, and everything like that. So like he's trying to figure out the entire situation situation here and like stop the 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 fox woman and all that kind of shit well like he also has a relationship with somebody else who seems to be helping him and knows him from the past and we have a lot of hijinks that ensue a lot of comedy a lot of weird silly things in like the theater we have a lot of fantasy fight scenes where people are jumping and flying through the air and stuff like that a lot of cool shit like that and a lot of kind of wild stuff and a lot of mythology that i liked but it is a romance story it is a fantasy story it is a tragedy at the end too so um yeah and there was some cool special effects of transforming in the fox i, I was kind of taking Taken back at the scale and the, the budget of this one, but I did enjoy it. So I would recommend checking out The Fox with Nine Tails. It is pretty interesting, pretty different, especially for 94, a lot of the stuff that I saw from 94. So yeah. Hey guys, what's up? We're here for You Ain't Seen. And uh, actually it's Blind Spot because you picked it for yourself because I yeah. put you under pressure. And you picked Theater of Blood from 1973, directed by Douglas Hickox. Not Hitchcock, Hickox. He actually directed a couple movies, one of which you're familiar with, uh, the John Wayne vehicle Brannigan. Oh, okay. Which this is a blast. Is okay, that's a fun one. And Sitting Target with Oliver Reed and Ian McShane, which is a really good movie. Um, so he also had a son named Anthony Hickox, who would go on to direct stuff like Waxwork, 1 and 2, um, Full Eclipse, Hellraiser 3, um, Sundown, Vampire and Retreat. So he, so he had a nice little career as well. So anyways, Theater of Blood is um, kind of like, I, I don't want to say this, it's kind of one of uh, the crown jewel in uh, Vincent Price's like later career. One of them. One of them. In that I, 70s career. Is. Yeah. So essentially what we have here is Vincent Price is a hammy Shakespearean actor who is snubbed at this uh, to get this Actor's Choice Award or something like that. Critics' Choice. Mm -hmm. All these critics never liked him. They always badmouth him. And he commits suicide suicide by plunging off a balcony um essentially what happens here is all these critics start to get killed in shakespearean ways um the critics there's about nine or ten of them and uh, a lot of them are familiar faces the ones that stand out to me are probably not going to be the ones that stand out to a lot of right. people you know being a horror fan I, I noticed dennis price from some of the hammer movies and jess franco movies he's great in it got a great look i love mm -hmm. dennis price and robert morley who is more of a classical actor, but he's pops up in a couple horror films as well. Which one is Morley? Uh, Morley is the one with the dogs. Okay. I mean, his performance is ham and cheesy and yeah. perfect. And also the, the kind of leader, the president of the critics is actually in um, Captain Kronos. He plays like an asshole in that. And he's in a bunch of movies. So had a, a lot of familiar faces. Um, Diana Rigg is in here as Diana Vincent Rigg. Price's daughter. So, of course, the whole big thing, it's not really a mystery. Vincent Price is obviously 
picking people off phantom of the opera style and ma many disguises um it's kind of like a spiritual sequel to fives i guess the third one and mm -hmm. he's using a group of army of homeless people that uh kind of as his like group kind of like in the the way that the phantom was helped yeah. by the homeless. so it's kind of like the phantom of the opera meets like a dark man style story five storyline five right? storyline yeah well i mean dark man ripped off fives and invisible man and all that kind of stuff right so but it is that kind of story right where you make these disguises to trick people and right right you the only difference i think in in this case is that price isn't disfigured um he but, but he is fives he is you know the fandom he is you know the darkman and the darkman <laughs> he's putting on these disguises and picking the critics yes. off so basically right. it, it, the cops catch on at one point and try to stop him they're complete morons it's a lot of hilarity they ensues. are utterly useless <laughs> um it's 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 got to be a statement by hickox maybe the writer as well and and vincent price about you know all these critics that are just so they poorly treat everybody mm -hmm. like that myself included and, um anytime i get the shit on someone i do it i'm, I'm just right. kidding but i'm not important enough to matter these guys are pretentious douchey guys that don't give whore or shakespeare anything like that and and so basically he confronts them all in these brilliant ways and reads the reviews to them and, and the elaborate death scenes the whole movie is just like elaborate death scene to elaborate death scene right yeah ba basically what had happened is is vincent price his character was doing a um like a, like a tour of Shakespeare where he was doing like like essentially nine Shakespearean plays back to back and all the critics snubbed these plays and you know he thought he was going to get the big reward and they gave it to some up and coming actor and uh, the, the the main guy had said like I only gave you those shitty reviews to like push you into like not doing Shakespeare like Ooh. Shakespeare's old news and he's he's wasn't very um, what is the word I'm looking for versatile. That's right, what he said he's the only the main guy is the only critic that seems to have any, and I want to say genuineness to him, decency. Right. Um, but the kills are what make the movie, and the first couple you don't really know exactly what's going on until it unfolds. But mm -hmm. the the highlight has got to be the last two kills are absolutely hilarious and brilliant, which which lets Price dress up in the most outrageous outfits, including like a super flamboyant like hairstylist. Yeah, like a. I guess it'd be 70, 70s disco 70, guy. Yeah. Yeah. And then also the the infamous kind of, um, what's the one where the characters, the woman's has her, I don't want to spoil the whole thing, but Robert Morley's, his death is probably the best, hands down. What's the play that one's based on? I don't remember which one Morley is. The Dogs. Oh, that's... Um... King Richard or something? It's not no, it does. It doesn't matter. I can't remember. Um, and as soon as we stop, I'll remember yeah. it. Diana um, Rigg uh, from stuff like Last Night in Soho, if yeah. people are unfamiliar, she plays Vincent Price's daughter, and it's obviously like they're trying to like have some big reveal. It's so fucking obvious. From the first, like, <laughs> right, five like, minutes. What's well, going on with her? Well, when they when they show about her her disguise at first, I, I didn't recognize it. Um, but then, but she's in like 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 a backstage and it's poorly lit. But then the second time you see that character, and like, you're like, oh wait a minute. Um, like so price always dresses up as well but also his army of homeless people dress yeah. up too so like you'll like not know what's happening kind of almost in like the sense like in a nightmare on Elm street movie you don't know it's a dream sequence you don't know the people are in trouble until like you start like spotting like the people the homeless people dressed up in different outfits in the back and that one part's really brilliant where they bring the guy for the wine tasting, the wine tasting and he doesn't great. register where he's at and then he's like this is a established wine restaurant then he looks around and everybody's like just these weird guys in like suits and stuff it's kind of like the asylums are running running the um you know the the inmates are running the asylum kind of right. moments like that that are really fun um you know because they have there's like like maybe like four or five like recognizable I'd homeless say like people. half a dozen yeah and, and you know they, they they show up and it's like and, and like you, you notice like 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 the tone change in the movie what was a wine tasting is now like a slaughter fest yeah. it's it's amazing um, I love that one. I love the uh, the the performance by the guy who's trying to pick up the young girl and yeah. his whole like demeanor and he's in the play and like he has to read and like read the line and he's like and when the people realize it's Price and and I I love Dennis Price's interaction with Price yes. when he realizes he's fucked he's like ah. So, like, it's just a real, like, gem to see, like, I, I love pick -em offs I love, like, the comedy things. And I think mm. it's better than Dr. Five's sequel. It's on, oh, it's on par it with Fives, I would say, for sure. Um, I, I, this is one of my favorite Price ones. It, it sits right at the top, really. It, it, I mean, you know, I had never seen it, but it is really entertaining. The All the critics are, 
just like like really smug pieces of shit and so and you get to spend like a good portion of the movie with them and like what like get to see who these people are like yeah there's like and we have the great flashback too we have the great we'll flashback you know there, there are like two or three deaths that start out where you don't really know who these characters are but they're still introduced um like like the first death like but you see him in the flashback so you, well, like you, you see him you yeah. see him the flashback but he has that whole scene about like kicking out the tenants i mean so so like you know who this guy is before you're ever introduced to like the critic circle. Yeah. Um, the the one thing I will notice is the the basically the um, format of the movie is a lot like 80 slasher films, and I feel like it's lifted because we have the killers being picked off, the people being picked off, and then like you have the flashback on what happened. Mm-hmm. Um, although like Slaughter High does it, you have the opening where they actually commit the thing, or but like the burning it has that opening too where they like commit the act, and then later it all plays into that. Although this one is not structured exactly like that, it's the same kind of deal. You wrong someone, and they're gonna come back for you. Well, you know, and and the these characters, um, the critics, like they're they all have like their different vices and plays uh, on the vices, you know? So yeah, these kills are based off of Shakespearean plays, but at the same time they play into the vices of the characters, yeah. like, you know, the, the gluttony, gluttony, the jealousy, um, the um, lustful one, the lustful one, like, like there's, you know, they're, it's just seven before seven. Yeah. But, but I mean, they're, they're <laughs> very fun too. They're very fun. They're very well, telegraphs and well broadcasted but in, but in like in a good way you know i i love when he reads some of the reviews from the critics and he reads robert morley and basically mm-hmm. he says one can't help but re- be reminded he's like when you see the two uh price's character is surrounded by two subtle uh wonderful performances that him sitting in the middle you you can't help but uh, remember a ham sandwich. Right. Recall a ham sandwich. I thought that was the funniest fucking <laughs> thing ever. Um, Price and Price and Morley's reviews. I think you read. They're both the meanest. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the I, I don't know. Is that, do we want to jump to the ending? I don't. I mean, you can you not spoil everything because we've been relatively right. spoiler free here. Right, right. I don't. I don't want to spoil a whole lot. But like, like when we get to the climax, um, the. Like, like, it's hard to tell if, like, Price is aware of what's going around him or if, like, they're acting. I feel that, like, his whole, you know, like, the final moments in the scene were, like, I don't think he was aware that the stuff was actually happening for real. It seems like he was just, like, he and his daughter, uh, Riggs, were, um, just kind of, like, acting, like, playing the scenes oh, out. Yeah. Does that make sense? Like, they're both, like, soliloquizing to each other and... It's well, like they are actors. They are they are actors, you know, and and he has this whole spiel. I, what, what? And, and Price plays it perfect too, because Price is playing it as a hammy actor who is acting while killing. Yes. So like he has to do his performances within like so it's just like really kind of a layered kind of performance in Price too, because just obviously you know Price probably got like oh he's just a hammy horror actor, but Price really could do lots of oh, stuff. Oh right. Like, and he was different before he was in the horror films. You exactly. Know? He was in the film yeah. And stuff. Um, um, go ahead if you have anything else to say. I don't think I have anything else to say. It was really good. It was, um, yeah, pri- probably in the top five price ones for sure. Nine out of ten for me on it. Um, I'm going to read from Creature Features, John Stanley. You got your book too, right? Oh, yeah. Okay, where are we at? Um, Theater of uh, Blood, 72. We can know it's 73. Four out of five. Macabre black comedy similar to Dr. Five series with its sick jokes and bloodletting. With Vincent Price as ham Shakespearean actor Edward Lionheart, who so murders scenes from the classics that London's critics murder him in the press. The murdering becomes literal when Lionheart has his revenge against the critics and the murderers murders them with the help of a band of bums, the true identity of which will surprise you. Death devices are borrowed from Shakespeare, a clever touch to Anthony Grinville Bell's script. Death la- Death's labor found you might say diana rigg jack hawkins harry andrews coral brown diana doors robert morley michael horton dennis price jelly good horror film from director douglas hickox aka much ado about murder and this is an mca united artist um before i read my aip aip AIP. it was Um, an aip like that purple drink that the homeless people drink that it's viper like, <laughs> we said it was it, viper. It, it looks so tasty like i wanted that whole mud scene was really cool um <clears throat> there was another thing I thought that I wanted to bring up, and I, I think it's already gone okay. now. Maybe I'll remember it in reading Tear on review. Tape, James O'Neill. Yeah. Perfect time to plug the book from 1993 or some shit. Tear right. on Tape. Just read it. They have to look at the cover in case they want to buy it. Yeah. 
in all the check marks I put right on from thirty years ago. I don't know what the check marks mean. Um, do 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 theater of blood. Four out of four stars. Oh, wow. He does four stars, so yeah. perfect rating. All right. This tailor-made vehicle is the hilarious pinnacle of Price's horror film career, as Edward Leinhardt Price has the sort of role actors dream of, a mad, incredibly egotistical Shakespearean actor who avenges himself on the critics who denied him a coveted award by murdering them in various manners inspired by the Bard's works, stabbing, burning, beheading, impaling, and dismembering his victims in grisly fashion. Energetic performing... Energetic performing from Price, Rig, both of them in a variety of disguises, Morley Andrews, Doors, and others, combined with Anthony Greville Bell's witty script, Michael J. Lewis's lovely score, and Hickox's, Hick, Hickox. Hickox's smooth direction to create a high-class shocker of unusual depth and intelligence. Do you want to read that? Yeah, we have a little Vincent Price over here on the side here, and they do this. And of course, but the the music was fantastic. Yeah, it was good too. Nineteen eleven and ninety three, the modern master of horror menace was born in St. Louis, Missouri, and made his Broadway debut in Victoria Regina, um, Regina, sorry, opposite Henry Hayes. A contract with Universal Pictures placed him in a couple of horror features, but it wasn't until the success of nineteen fifty three three D smash, uh, House of Wax, that Price was given a plum horror part. He thereafter solid solidified his terror kick reputation with appearances in several delightfully crash William Castle Chillers and the inexpensive but lush looking Edgar Allan Poe adaptations of Roger Corman. Velvet Voice Vinny was also a world renowned art expert, author and gourmet. Once referred to as the King of Hamsters, Price was actually ha- Hamsters, that's funny. Price was actually a much better and more versatile actor, especially in comedy than he was ever given f- credit for most mainstream fit by most mainstream film critics which plays right into the theater of Blood. right and he's got a list of a bunch of movies we should mention uh we did watch that boris karloff yeah um, we the, did. The, on, on shutter the boris karloff doc mm-hmm. and and vincent price was a part of that and that was a lovely scene seeing them act together and everything like You're that right. stage and and karloff's great man i love karloff too i love i love these horror guys like they're irreplaceable like they're they're from a time that i don't think that you could ever, ever get make back again you know, yeah never get these guys again and i think like the last like people like that even in the 80s you had some but it really never like bruce campbell and maybe robert england but maybe still like you'll you'll never even have another bruce campbell well i, I think that like the tone of horror has changed, changed so much, in yeah. you know not not even the past 20 years but even the past 40 the um, idea of a scream queen or somebody like that is just not likely right yeah you know, I, I think that horror is if you brand most quality i don't want to say this is rude but if you brand somebody as a scream queen people would take it as an insult well, yeah, but I'm, I mean, even just having horror icons in general, I think that it's, it, it's just if you don't make like the type of horror movies that like you, where you would get somebody like Price and, or Karloff yeah. or, um, Law Cheney Jr., Bell Lugosi, you know, and, and, Cushing, any of those guys, yeah, right, you know, it's just I, I feel like horror was always something that was kind of like lighthearted and more. Eh, a lot of them were very dark. Well, I mean, they matter. they were dark, but they they weren't like dark dark like like they were almost fantastical at the same time of being well we know the story horror. that basically the 70s came along and kind of killed that classic and then we had like some of the 70s throw but right. now everything is a throwback to either something like this or something to the 70s it's like everything is being thrown back and recreated because the it's just like a big blob of pop culture now everything is like nostalgia, nostalgia well they have the nostalgia. nostalgia cycle but i mean well you know i feel like the cycles are starting to cycle each other and all we're getting right. is blob nostalgia and there's rarely get something that's not based on nostalgia alone i, I I mean soho was a nostalgic film and I, but it know, also kind of placated on hey you know the good old times weren't so good either right Right, exactly which is a smart way to do it now because you don't have much of a fucking choice when it comes to the nostalgia cycle you know then in watching that that karloff documentary it's like I, you know i would love to have like local like horror hosts and, and i would they like have that them to be but they're thing. on like access access cable yeah, yeah, you have to pay and, for them and stuff you like know that, it, yeah. it's weird it's, it's not something where well, they still got joe bob yeah, they do have Joe Bob, and you know, like he's a national treasure. Love Joe um, Bob. Just unfortunately, never can watch every Friday night. Right. You know, but but that's the thing, though. Like it used to be, like your local station had a guy that came in in grease paint, and 
you know, you got Chili to watch. Bill was uh, actually Laurie Cardell's dad. Yeah. Chili Bill Cardell from uh, Night of the Living Dead was their whore host. Yeah. And, and you, Weatherman. Right. Exactly. <laughs> I love well, that. But that's exactly it. Too. You know, you, yeah. you, you, you dress up grandpa like a vampire and you watch public domain horror movies. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. My grandpa would have made a good horror host. Oh, I think so. Absolutely. Um, you know, it, it's just, it's weird to see that gone, that like, like that, like tinge of Americana and like so when you're watching like Karloff or Price I like like it, it fills me with it it makes me nostalgic yeah. for a time that I never lived through which is kind of weird that's why old Hollywood or even like even lesser extent anything that's old just kind of brings you to that like or even like if they do the regional horror films like the yeah. old ones even if they're like cheap it just kind of brings you like a set to look at it like you go in a store in 1984 and you just look around like heh Look like, how recent. Is weird. Look, look at these cereals. Like right. you can remember it because you still have that kind of feeling. I, mm -hmm. I like it. You know. Oh yeah. It's such a different time now. But I'm anyways, old. get off my lawn. Right. Nine out of ten feet of blood. Oh, if I see a teenager, I immediately call the police. I don't care where I'm at. Yeah. Um. <laughs> uh, see, what I like to do is I, I, I post these big, long <coughs> stories about when I was a kid, we used to play till the lights went down and the street lights came out. We used to run through the fields and catch frogs. But then at the same time, when I hear kids playing basketball in the street, I call the cops. Right. Because exactly. I want to just be upset and annoyed by everything. That's that's people nowadays. They're like, get outside and play. And then they're like, stop playing basketball, my <laughs> It's true. It's true. Uh, um, so, yeah, a 9 out of 10 for Theater of Blood. Uh four and a half out of five easily Same. yeah it's it, it's really good um i i think i do like the raven a tad more raven i i think i i, I listed last man on earth as a better movie but i don't i personally i don't think it's it's not better but i i have that i just was so taken aback how much it was night of the living dead and i almost had a heart attack right I, well like, i knew i knew that he based off night of the living dead off i am legend mm -hmm. so i knew that but it was just a lot closer than I expected. Well, well when, when if you're looking at Vincent Price's, I, I think the great ones, um, obviously, uh, whatever we just watched. Theater of Blood. <laughs> Theater of Blood. I mean, there's lots. There's lots. Yeah. I mean, House on Haunted Hill is a very popular one. We never finished watching. I remember we put it in years one ago. night years I, ago. and I, I, I think That's we funny. Just that's like one of the biggest blind spots of all time on my list is House right. on Haunted Hill. And I keep on meaning to pick it, but of course but every seen, time I've I... seen other William Castle flicks of course I, yeah um did, didn't he do tingler or he did the tingler and I'm tingler is a hole in you the size of a medium great and i love that i love the tingler um tingler you know thing, house yeah. of wax i mean price is one of the best of all time and you get to the right. aip stuff you see haunted palace and and the roger corman shit and, and i love the post, corman stuff. Post adaptations right all great stuff i mean he's unmatched he's but you know when you get the raven you have karloff laurie and and price and Jack Nicholson <laughs> um, fits right up there with him. Right, fantastic stuff, fantastic yeah, but, uh, stuff. It's a shame he ruined his career with The Shining. Fucking idiot. <laughs> um, so <laughs> it's my pick. Yeah. Hmm. So are what you the, Japanese you... rape revenge right. movie am I picking this week? What? I just watched like one more, more ninety four. <laughs> Tear in the woods, <laughs> that classic that no Tear by Night or some shit. You're like, what is this? I'm done with ninety four. Um, you made me watch the fucking crow, and I'm not rewatching that for ninety four. I don't care. <laughs> I don't think it's a horror movie. I think it's a superhero movie. Even though it I watched a, a bunch of shit that's movie. not a horror movie. Yeah. I just don't want to watch the crow again. Okay. My rating's not going to change. I've seen the crow five times. It's not changing. You've seen the crow five times. Probably growing up. Yes, the crow is a popular movie. I never never seen it i don't know how but uh <laughs> my pick's the crow <laughs> just okay so i'm gonna give you a choice why do i okay something you never gave you me. know but he to be Shh. fair guys he actually picked the movie last week if you recall no it didn't happen no so I that's didn't. why i'm giving you the choice i said mama mia he said we're not watching mama we ain't fucking mia. watching mama mia you still didn't pick a shit you're like ruining my channel you're like we're gonna watch <laughs> alvin and the I'm chipmunks christmas the you're ruining the channel <laughs> you're ruining it all right, All right so, so so what are my choices? Angst from 1983. Mm -hmm. It's a very. It, I don't know if you know who Gaspar Noe is. No. Or Gaspar No. Gaspar No. Uh, Irreversible. Enter the Void. You don't know Irreversible? You ain't never seen Irreversible. No, I didn't know. It's a rape revenge movie that goes backwards. I don't watch rape revenge. It's it's an art film though. Oh, it's fancy art. Yeah, they go into a club called the Rectum. It's an art film. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay, so this is one of his favorite films. It's Angst, 1983. It's a really really well shot serial killer movie it's really bleak really crazy um it's relatively short too and then there's the cure from 1997 it's directed by the guy who did pulse you know What's the pulse the japanese ghost story pulse which is really wild so it's a japanese movie? it's a japanese movie it's longer though i bet it's like two hours and some change oh, so what? you got the long movie you're gonna like better that you probably uh -huh. will enjoy or you got the short movie that is a good movie and you but you might not enjoy it. i don't i don't think you'll have any problems with angst 
No, but I, I can't... mean, your it's from the same company originally that the Barrel that put all the York Buckarat movies out. So what it's like Barrel are you talking? There was about? a company called Barrel. They put out the York Buckarat movies. They were gonna put out Angst and Dertoska, and then they closed down. And then eventually, Cult Epics put out all the uh, York Buckarat movies and Angst. So. I feel like it has some DNA with with York Buckarat. You've seen a lot of York Buckarat movies. I did like that one with that that um that girl in it. No, I didn't Necromantic like it too. No. no, the York. Bur- he has four feature length movies. Well, I like the one I watched. Necromantic too. Oh no! You know who I'm thinking of? You're trash. I'm thinking of um who's the guy that was going to do Dune. What is wrong with you? What's his name? Yodorowsky. Yeah, that's who I'm thinking of. Well, We're I talking take... about Santa Sangre. Yeah, I take back everything. I... How do you mix up Alejandro Yodorowsky and York Buckaret? You just that's like mixing up acid and a rock. You know, you... there are certain rocks that if you mix with water, will actually shut up. What is it? Which one? Well, I know that if you mix it like the, the Japanese one. The, or the, the, the Japanese German one. one. You going with the Japanese We're one? We're going with the Japanese one. The Cure. Okay. The Cure. Yes. Okay. From nineteen ninety seven. From nineteen ninety seven. I've not seen it. It's a blind spot then. So it's a blind spot for both of us. I've seen Angst though, and it's good. Yeah, I feel like you want me to watch Angst. I don't give a shit. Okay, then we're watching The Cure. Yeah. By a Japanese guy in nineteen ninety seven. From nineteen ninety seven. We're not watching it in nineteen ninety seven. I don't think that's possible yet yet but if it will be possible in the future then it wouldn't be possible now isn't that how time travel works yeah but they're not gonna let us know they won't let us remember maybe they'll go back in time and steal some rare tape out of my dvd yeah exactly and be like we need one copy of super hell they're, uh, they're, the they're johnny com- walker collection we gotta have it they're coming from the future and stealing the slip covers to sell on <laughs> ebay <laughs> Where do my Lionsgate slipcovers go? <laughs> my restaurant collection. We're <laughs> done. Bye. All right, guys, let's get these questions, comments, concerns. We have some old answers that I missed from last week. And essentially, I basically asked you guys any weird Japanese films that you really enjoyed. Recommendations. The Maniac said, Would Hell Driver count as a weird Japanese movie? I love those hyper violent Japanese flicks like Tokyo Gore Police and Machine Girl. They've got me curious about those weird bloody flicks. I'll be checking those out. Joe Carroll, uh, I like uh, Mei Chong's Daily Life, the movie. Uh, Midori, uh, The Camilla Girl. Uh, Murkuku, uh, Murkuru trilogy, Splatter, Naked Blood, all weird as hell. And Liverleaf, that's almost a normal movie compared to the others, but well made, sad, and violent. I love it. Great show as always. Thank you. Um, James Grimmer, House, Gaki Dama, Battle Heater, Tetsu the Iron Man, and Wild Zero all come to mind. Ken Coakley, uh, this is regarding your Mad Dog Morgan pickup. Dennis Hopper had done quite a few westerns, and in all western movies and TV shows, he never rides a horse. He does in Mad Dog Morgan, but it was the first time. When he did westerns in the 50s and 60s, he did westerns with Clint Eastwood, John Wayne, twice. Yeah, of course, he was in True Grit. He has the great scene, and how he was in, uh, was he in Hang Em High, I believe? So, um, he also says, when it comes to strange Japanese movies, there's only one king, and in my opinion, that's 1977 horror hit House, or Houseu. I saw it in an all-night horror movie marathon a few years back. It was the first movie shown. Also, on the bill were Reanimator, Phantasm, and Day of the Dead, so it brings back the, the, a happy memory. Um, basically, then we have The Red Room. I got the same Mad Dog Morgan set. Great movie, totally ridiculous, and special features. Definitely watch the old making of. Dennis Hopper is the drunkest he has ever been on screen in that movie. LOL. Lee Davis, Evil Dead Trap. Sam Edwards, Haosu, Big Man Japan, Happiness of the Katakuras versus Paprika, the Tetsuo series. Nick Mua, as I don't know all that many weird Japanese features, I'll go with Ichi the Killer. Weird enough, yes, Sensei Dave, I guess. Questions, which country has the strangest cinema? Japan? Hong Kong? America? Lots of lots of strange cinema. Um, what was it like shooting your last short film? Um, which short film? Um, you mean from like Halloween Spookies, or um, you mean like that little short we made for fun? I, I mean, I don't. Oh, or Amy. I, I, I mean, you have to be more specific. I, I don't know the timeline you're talking of. Um, as far as shooting Amy, I was up for like 24 hours to finish it, but it was worth it. Um, it was fun though. I mean, we had a good cast and Dustin directed, so it was pretty easy. When were you first confronted with death? Were you confused? It was a di- was it different from a movie? What? When were you first confronted with death? Were you confused? It was it was it different from the movie? Happy Easter with lots of chocolate. First time I was confronted with death would probably have been my. Gr- I mean, I saw movies where I, I realized that people could die. The Blob 1988 was one when I was like, oh, so you kids can die too. But my grandfather, when I was like six, is the first time I had a real brush with death. Um, that died and basically it was explained to me. Um, 
he's never coming back. And I, I didn't care that he was going to die until they said, you're never going to be able to see him again. That's what made me understand death was that sentence, never being able to see somebody again. So, I mean, it was obviously different from a movie. I wasn't watching a movie and it just wasn't like a, a horror movie scene where somebody was in like a shootout or being killed by a killer. It was somebody dying slowly in a hospital that you've seen every day. So yeah, I mean, I don't know what you want to get from that. So then new answers here. Um, Isimisio, um, oh wait, yeah, so she basically mentions the guinea pig films get better. What did I ask last week? Um, oh, basically, uh, your, so just, it'll pertain to a lot of these if people answer. Your dream podcast, three people from any podcast, no matter the size, anything like that. So your dream podcast crew can be from different podcasts, different styles, whatever. Isimisio, the guinea pig films get better as they go along when they actually have a real narrative. Love Perfect Blue, both story and aesthetics. For podcasts, I would pick you, Moods, JP, Oh, so I pick you, Moods, JP, Tom Horsball, and Dave Z because I'm always interested in what you guys have to say. Uh, Synergy-wise and overall chemistry, I'd go with a group of threes. You, Moods, and Tom in one podcast, and then Moods, JP, and Dave Z in another. Very cool. Ken Coakley, aside from yourself, I have to say that I like Durant Cinema. He's a fellow Massachusetts guy who does videos of Blu-ray shopping at Best Buy, Target, FYE, and Bull Moose. I frequented uh, before the accident that landed me in the nursing home. He doesn't do much of boutique titles, but I think I may have talked him into taking a chance on the Phantasm Steelbook. He also was lucky enough to get Cruel Jaws at Bull Moose before it was pulled from Severin. I also like Tear for Tom. He does updates every month on his movies, books, toys. I thought you were him because you look a little like him and your voices are similar. Um, I never actually, I don't know if I've seen a picture of Tear for Tom. Travis Linscombe, dream podcast team would be Sam Deacon. Um, Twitch of Death, Dart of Darkness, you and Richard Glenn Schmidt. Hell, this is the Doom Show. Seriously, you got either of them on the secret top ten. That would be awesome. Uh, I mean, Sam Deegan's big time, right? And I've heard, I listened to Hello, This is the Doom Show. I've never talked to Richard, but I love his podcast. He's very funny, and his editing is very good. Paul Conway, The Big Racket is a masterpiece there. I agree. Uh, ben Masters, The Big Racket is excellent. Heroin Busters is pretty good, too. I recommend Napoli Spara, Weapons of Death, 1977, with Leonard Mann and Henry Silva. Currently on Netflix, a very good and violent Polizia Death. Very cool. I'll check it out. Um, Adam Watson. So many reviews with Jeremy this week. LOL. Tempo Tapos. Do you watch most Gialli and Plizio Tetsis in English audio? Uh, most of the time I do. I watch most Italian and Spanish horror from before like 1990 or that time in English because a lot of the actors on set were speaking their native language and a lot of the actors are speaking English. So therefore it just like translates better. A lot of times they'll dub their own voice like Arthur Kennedy and let's sleep a corpse is lie or something. I believe did his own voice or Donald Pleasance and fan phenomenon. So like I, um, I know you're saying that, but like uh, I do, I do, but occasionally I'll pop in a spaghetti Western or a Plizia Tetsi or a Gialli and the English dub is so poor and just most of the actors aren't English and it just sounds like pure dog shit. I thought Django, the English dub original for Django, was pretty rough, so I, I watched that in Italian. So occasionally I will watch them in Italian, but most of the time I try for English first. But a lot of the other countries, like Japan, I, I don't want to watch the English dub unless it's maybe some of the Japanese, some of the Godzilla movies. But most of the time I, I go for English, I go for the native language, except for some of the ones that didn't record live audio at the time. Um, uh, Rob Kopinski, um, Rod Barrett, The Bloody Pit. Justin Kurzweil, The Hysteria Continues, and Moods, 22 Shots of Horror. Three horror of Euro horror. Tom Brooker, Moods, 22 Shots, with Duncan McLeish, Teapots, and Lee Russell. They must be destroyed on site. Good choice. Corey Walter, JP from 22 Shots, Dave Z from Exploding Heads, and Paul Shear from How Did This Get Made podcast. Joachim Johansson, you, Mike White, David Larson, and Richard Blix. Uh, Mike White's from Projection Booth. I'm a big-time guy there, too. I'm not sure on the last two, actually. Amy Fox Goodwin, you, Emma of Spooky Astronauts, and Tanner Tubach from Unbox, watched and reviewed. I'd love to do something with Tanner. It's very funny. If I could pick a pinch hitter, it would be Rebecca McKendry from Shockwage, which I think they quit podcasting when the pandemic started. Um... I just looked her up out of curiosity. Went to, They went to Fangoria Network with a show called Colors of the Dark. Yeah, I love Colors of the Dark. I loved uh, Shockwaves. Big fan of Rebecca McKendry and Elric Kane. Sean Bruckner uh, basically fills this in. McKendry and Elric are back as they changed their name to Colors of the Dark. That's their second name change. They were originally Killer POV, which I highly recommend if you haven't went back to check those out. Killer POV had some of the best interviews, horror interviews of all time, in my opinion. Amazing podcast. He also continues. Um, his choice would be Mick from uh, Mick Garris from Postmortem, Moods from 22 shots and Elric from killer pov shockwaves my horror podcast game is pretty darn weak though admittedly and there are, those are practically the only three i listen to along with corpse cast if anyone has any good recs i love them i'm sure this thread will be will deliver plenty okay so just off the top of my head um 
There's a bunch of them out there, depending on what you're looking for. Obviously, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast has not been mentioned yet. Well, Dave Z from that, but I obviously going to shout out 22 Shots. But some of the bigger ones, All Colors of the Dark is great. Um, geez, I know Postmortem's a good show. Some of the, like, if you're into extreme cinema, check out Sick on Cinema. Those guys are pretty funny. They do some wild things. And then there's, a, like, Duncan McLeish from Podcast Under the Stairs. That's a big network. I mean, he does lots of stuff on there. And then we have The Dark Parade with Bo Ransdell, if you like them. Uh, Bo is pretty good at what he does. Good does good stuff and then there's a lot of other ones like fresh cuts at disney movies um friday nightmares uh geez horrorcast um uh watsy uh party podcast i'm just going off the top of my head here there's so many good ones that i know them. quality violent cinema if you're into extreme stuff so uh morbid horse uh podcast geez I- i'm going down like the ones that i listen to on a regular pierce cinema they don't do all horror but they cover lots of different stuff here um who else um uh, Cinema Attack, um, geez, um, No More Room in Hell, uh, geez, there's a lot of podcasts out there you could subscribe to that are really good stuff, and I know I'm missing a bunch that I do really like too. So then we have David Gibson, sorry to bend the rules, but William Friedkin and any other filmmakers you choose. And that would be great to have Friedkin just talk to filmmakers. Darren uh, Burroughs, Justin Kurzweil, Moods, CK from Dead Pit. Um, also should mention Nashy Cast. Um, and Hysteria Continues. Those are both good podcasts as well. And, of course, anything um, uh, Ken Ellinger does is also good. Um, then he also considers... All, another three I would like to see is Cat Ellinger, Dave Parker, and Lauren Dixon from... Um, from visited by voices on YouTube, uh, Ken Ellinger's big time. Like, I, like well, every time somebody puts me in with a big time person, I'm like I don't want to screw up their reputation. <laughs> Sean Donahue, Larry King, Howard Stern, and H.G. Wells. Strange. Sam Edwards, uh, Moods, uh, Moods from Six, obviously Twenty Two Shots. Ricky Morgan, who has a good podcast as well, and Jeffrey X Martin. Would be a lot of laughing on that podcast. Ricky Morton says, Hell, well, half of those almost became its own show. Nick Moore, as I like to mix things up, I w- I'd like to see or r- rather hear a horror slash genre movie podcast comprising of Cat Ellinger, Justin Kurzweil, and Red Letter Media's Mike uh, Stozlakas. This would make for an intriguing listen, I'm sure, especially as they all have different views. Question, how long is too long for a podcast? I will tell you, I know I don't mind listening to long podcasts because I, when I'm working, I can listen. So I'll listen to anything. So I don't mind the length, but recording, we recorded a 10 hour podcast for our top 50 favorite directors on 22 shots. And that was too long. Eight hour podcast, I believe, or something like that. I wanted to die. So I would say anything after three hours recording in one sitting is too much. Three hour recording time is too much for one sitting to to, to do. Um, Lucas Tout, 22 shots and Pizzo well, and Christian Hannah Hoare together on one show. Okay. I know uh, Pizzo well, I know he does reviews and everything like that. Uh, Mark Vinnington, Jeremy Freeman times three, the man, the myth, and the legend. And he says, uh, okay. <laughs> uh, Lacey Lou, um, Jamie J. Sammons, uh, another good podcast, House of Sammons. Check them out. Watson and Christian Luciani, I think, would be epic. Um, Watson's on a couple other podcasts, too. One, um, she's Horror Movie Podcast with Jay the Dead. That's a good one, too, to check out if people are still looking. But Lacey Lou has a podcast, too. Um, what is it? Uh, Slumber Party Massacre Podcast. Very good as well. Enjoy that. Um, so check that out. James D. Cowks, Watson, and James Day Park, uh, James Day. Dave Parker together would be fun. I think the co- contrasting styles would be, work well. Yeah, that, that would be fun. Um, we could call it Mr. Mr. I made that joke with Mr. Watson before. He basically, Watson replies, ironically, when we were on the Summer Series together, we pissed people off by teaming up to get the Greasy Strangler on the show. Hell, well. We should basically just do a podcast about the Greasy Strangler. A minute-by-minute minute podcast about the Greasy Strangler, Mr. Mr. Podcast. David Luton, uh, Troy Haworth, he says, David Luton, my, uh, he says, Dave me, um, Troy Haworth, and Rob Kopinski doing an Italian horse special. Yeah, I love I love Troy Haworth. Again, I, I don't want to stink up and ruin their reputations. So uh, basically, let's do the question of the week. And since I, I kind of want to dive into like covering a lot of the indie films and extreme films, maybe I, I skipped out on in the last couple years because I know I used to cover some all the time. Um, maybe uh, basically give me an extreme horror film or an indie film in recent years that you want to see me cover. You know, it could be hell a friends movie that you really liked or just an extreme kind of weird movie from the underground or, or old Japanese film or something that you'd like to see me cover on the show. Uh, I'll get a bunch of them together and put them in a bag maybe and draw a couple or something like that. If you, if you guys would like that. So yeah, anyways, we're going to hop into that cinema wasteland update. I'm going to toss in a couple other things I picked up as well, but uh, yeah, let's get into it. All right, let's start with the non wasteland stuff just to, to get it out of the way not that it's worse but yeah here we go first up is the antichrist by uh who did this alberto di martino he did a bunch of horror films including what 
the uh, one with uh, Kurt Douglas, which is kind of the um, Omen ripoff. He'd chosen, chosen something. Holocaust 2000 or 3000 or something along those lines. So Antichrist is an Exorcist ripoff. It's got uh, Mel Frera or Arthur Kennedy in there. It's a, it's a decent one. I'm not the biggest fan of, you know, Exorcist ripoffs, but I, I don't think this one's too bad. Pretty Fairly decent movie for sure. Then up next, we have, the, those are from the Kino sale. I didn't do much on the Kino. God's Gun with Lee Van Cleef and Jack Palance. So it's got Richard Boone and Sybil Danning in here. So anytime they're going to release Spaghetti Westerns, I will be buying them. So yeah, now, I haven't had a chance to watch this one, but of course I'm sure I'll, I'll dig it for sure. Um, yeah. Same uh, director from uh, the Sabato movies. Uh, Sabato movies, so that's cool. And last from the Kino sale, I know what you're saying. I did skip beyond it because I had Wasteland. I only got three. Another Stakeout with Richard Dreyfuss, Emilio Estevez, Rosie O'Donnell. I remember these Stakeout movies as a kid, uh, always on TV. I barely remember them. I don't know which one I saw, but I, I know I did see some of them. And last is not from Kino, but this is Unlucky Money. And this movie looked pretty wild. Uh, Asian, uh, I think Japanese. Uh, just, yeah. just I saw I saw some stills from it. And I was like, oh, that movie looks wild. Definitely want to pick that up, check it out. So, yeah. I, I found that the DVD was still available for a relatively good price. So I grabbed it. Unlucky Money. Now let's get into the Wasteland stuff. Um, yeah, I guess I'll start with the 4Ks first. I only got two 4Ks. First up is uh, Possession. That's right. Um, the Zulowski film. And this is a crazy movie. Uh, good price on this. Um, uh, who is it? Uh, uh, Isabel uh, Ajani and uh, Sam Neill. Uh, so yeah, I had to pick this up. It has subtitles, of course, and it has the uh, English, French. So anyways, um, uh, great. If I'm, uh, what is this company? The Black Cat. Uh, I have a couple of these film uh, from them, and I, I have not a chance to pop any in. But for that price, I, I wanted to grab that. I didn't know it was a UHD. <laughs> right when they told me, I was like, need it. And then up we have uh, next is the Sword and a Sorcerer, which is an absolute ridiculous movie. Um, I, I've seen it a couple times as a kid, so I, I kind of have like a younger, I say teen. I have a kind of a soft spot for this one, and I can't believe it's on uh, 4K. But uh, yeah, so anyways, it's Albert Pune who did a bunch of crazy movies. It has Richard Lynch in there and uh, Richard Mole. Uh, yeah, so Sword and a Sorcerer on 4K, crazy world. Um, and then I guess we'll just hop into some of the Blu-rays. Um, is this deluxe edition of the Osterman Weekend by Sam Peckinpah from, um, is this imprint? Um, yeah, so this looks amazing, this set. Nice hard box. Um, uh, this has a theatrical cut in 1080 and the director's cut, which is crazy. So after I had heard that the Blu-ray version was, was pretty crummy from the States, um, I saw this there and I was like, well, I'm a big Peckinpah fan. I like this movie. I'm going to grab it. Uh, up next, we have um, Free Hand for a Tough Cop with um, just this this guy. This poor guy is the guy in this, who died in the Martino movie. Henry Silva, Thomas Milan, and I guess that's Claudio Casanelli. I never knew his name. I know he's in a suspicious death of a minor. Uh, uh, the de suspicious death of a minor above suspicion or some shit like that. I can't think of the name. But, uh, yeah, this is uh, one, one I've not seen. So, so I picked this up. Uh, I don't really know much about this movie. And it, for a while, I was like, man, is this one I already have? Being like I have a lot of these lens, Lenzi, Polizia, Tetsis, and crime films. So, so, I, so I picked this one up. Um, not cheap, but it looks like a very nice addition. So, Up next, had to have it from Synapse. Um, this is Tombs of the Blind Dead, the Steelbook edition. This is a classic Spanish horror film uh, that spawned a series, four films in the series. Everybody remembers the old uh, coffin set from Blue Underground. But uh, yeah, only one of these has been put on Blu-ray in the States, and that was from Screen Factory. Uh, was it The Ghost Galleon or Night of the Seagulls? I can't remember which one. But uh, yeah, so now we have the first one on Blu-ray, uh, the Steelbook. So these Synapse Steelbooks are pretty cool. Had to grab it. Up next is another cover with a bunch of nudity on there. And I guess this is like from Real Gore as well. This is like a semi-remake of A Stage Fright. You can see the Owl Mask Killer on there. Nightmare Sympathy? Symp uh, sympathy. Um, so yeah, um, I, I don't know much about this, but it looks like... Um, uh, Domenzio, I always have trouble saying his name is involved with it, so I'm sure it's very highly sexualized and and uh, probably pretty crazy. Don't don't know what I'm getting into on this one, but uh, yeah, from real gore as well. Yeah, so 
Um, this one was very strange to me, and I, I put off on buying it. I always buy all the Vinegar Syndrome ones, but the, this is what? Uh, no girlfriend, no job, no car, no life, no funeral. Um, I don't even know what the fucking thing. Yeah, the, the FW, no girlfriend uh, movie. It's supposed to be like this weird documentary thing, and I really don't necessarily know. Like... Um, that feeling with no girlfriend, it's like supposed to be, like somebody said, like the, the person at the table sold it to me, said it's the most honest looking, honest look at this kind of documentary and everything like that. So, so I, I was interested and like, I do collect massacre video. They really haven't let me down. Some of their movies I don't love, of course, but they're always interesting to own. So yeah, pick that one up. And then we got some from the Severn table. This is pretty cool here. This is the, um, uh, the Caligula box here with this nice hard box and the coin in there. Very cool. It's, uh, of course, has two Caligula movies in here. Uh, what is this? Oh, geez, that, that, that quote on there. Malcolm McDowell obviously had it easy. If anybody's ever seen Caligula, it's a crazy, crazy movie, of course. So what we have here is two kind of other Caligula movies. We have Caligula, The Untold Story by Joe D'Amato, the legend Joe D'Amato. Lots of features on that. Um, and then we also have... Caligula and Messalina, a film by Bruno Mattei. So that's right, Bruno Mattei and Joe D'Amato in the same box set about Caligula. <laughs> Ultimate sleaze set right there, right? What else do we have from Severn Films, of course? We got The Big Sleazy, Crypt of Dark Secrets, and Death Brings Roses, uh, Jake Wells, or Wyatt Weiss, a uh, double feature, which I've not seen either of these movies, so I picked this up. Uh, why not, right? Um, Definitely collect Severin, like what they do, so there's two more. And I believe it's by the director of the next title, Mardi Gras Massacre. You gotta love Mardi Gras Massacre, made the video nasties list. One that I've heard for years was pure shit. Um, remakes, set, light remake of Blood Feast, never watched it. Bought the thing three fucking times, maybe four. This is the fourth time I bought this thing. I really ought to watch this. So, and then be disappointed like supposedly everyone else. Does have some features on there, so maybe I'll like it. Maybe I'm expecting the worst and I'll have, I'll have some fun with it, right? You never can tell. Then we have Stone from Severn Films. This is a Ozploitation biker classic, they say. Never seen it, uh, so yeah, why not? Probably the best biker film ever made. Wow, that's cool. It's a nice... Uh, so yeah, anyways, check this one out. like the cover art there, badass. So Blu-ray of Stone. And I like buying Severin at a convention because they always do a good deal. Three new releases for 20, that kind of deal. Um, then we have Mother of Tears on Blu-ray. This is a Region B. And uh, yeah, it's been a long time since I watched Mother of Tears, but it's from uh, Koch Films. Of course, the third Mothers of a Mothers series in the Dario films, of course. After Suspiria and Inferno. Then we have Bad Girls, which I bought from my friend. Um, this is an independent movie by Christopher Bickle. Uh, not sure how this one is. I heard I heard some things about it. And anyways, it's an independent flick, so why the hell not? Uh, there we go. Has some cool shit in there, too. Looks like an Indiegogo one. Reversible cover. Nice. Um, these were being sold for a good price here. This is Hedwig and the Angry Inch, uh, a used copy of the Criterion Blu-ray. Uh, 15 bucks, couldn't pass it up. And this is one I've never seen. I know a lot of people like this one. I've heard some of the soundtrack, and it is pretty enjoyable. But uh, yeah, nice booklet in there as well. So You can get some really good deals at Cinema Wasteland. Some people have tables, and they're, they're looking to sell. They're looking to sell. Um, and another criterion we have here is uh, 1984, which I've never seen. But again, $15 for the Blu-ray. Why not check it out? Cool stuff. We'll get into some of the DVDs. That's right, I, I picked up some DVDs while I was there. Um, Knife in the Water by Roman Polanski. Uh, yeah. Never seen this. It was a DVD. It was only 10 bucks. Special edition here. Looks like it's got some sticky stuff still stuck on there. So, two discs though. It's got everything in there. Pretty nice. Why not, right? And then we got Freak by Lucky Soretti. Looks obviously like some James Bell effects going on there. Split head. Bloody gory and imaginative horse society. It's probably a quote from my boy Mac Brewer, right? Mac? 
Um, what else do we got here? I picked up some movies. I'm trying to set them down somewhere. I'll open the case up, show you guys if I can. Oh, that's not good. Well, we got a pin here. That's cool from Dead Visions. I thought the disc was falling out on me. I was like, oh, no. Then we have um, The Kindness of Strangers. Also by Lucky Soretti. I think this is a short film. I think this is his first film. So another pin as well. Chicken's Blood, which I know is by Chuck Condry, who's a friend of mine. Pick this up. Got this pretty cheap, Parts of the Family, trauma film. Two movies, same zombie story, two different directors. Bizarre. I don't know, I'm open to these cases. Like, a lot of them are just like, who's the cover of a disc? Uh, Body Parts, another one from Trauma, of course. And Dead Hooker's Guide to the Galaxy. Interesting, interesting. Uh, <laughs> yeah. There we go. And then another DV Death Mask by uh, Steve Ladshaw, right? This uh, Linnea Quigley's in here. Steve Ladshaw did like Vampire Trailer Park and uh, Biohazard and stuff like that. He did a bunch of movies. Um, kind of a harder one to find here on DVD. So now I am a proud owner of Death Mask. That's right. couple more DVDs for you. I don't know how to say this. Uh, Paz Yucas, which was at the Toxic Filth table. And this looked wild, man. A bunch of, like, shorts, and it's just loaded. Like, that back of the box here is very, very loud, if that makes any sense. There's so much shit going on. It's two disc, like, a lot of shorts on there, Dead Visions on there. I, It just looks like this packed, like, special edition of everything. Island of Vomit and Despair. Very cool. Glad I picked that up. And then last... Uh, on the DVDs, but certainly not least, is Spirit Animal. Um, signed and everything um, by Madeline Deering, which I've not seen. Uh, Jonathan Knight has a quote on there from B-Movie uh, Reviews and everything. This is fucking awesome. Jonathan Knight, B-Movie Madness. Check it, check it, uh, check him out. Is it Badness or Madness? Anyways, check uh, check Jonathan Knight out. Good guy, YouTuber. Uh, yeah, so I look forward to checking this one out. I guess it's SOV, smell vision card included. That's right. Uh, <laughs> Dingo Pizza. Yeah, it sounds fun. Anyways, I will be checking that out. And they got a new movie coming out, like Bath, uh, Bath, Bathtub Shark Attack or some shit like that. And then we have a VHS, just for nostalgia's sake, Bone Chillers. I used to watch this as a kid. Uh, maybe I'll show it to my cousin. We can laugh a little bit at this. I, I think I might have had this VHS. Look at this monster on the back. Anyways, this is kind of like kids' things we used to watch. But anyways, we're going to hop back to the video. Uh, yeah. All right. Thank you guys very much for watching. And as always, have a good one. Mm.